Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on, chair on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving public testimony for the record. You can do this several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website, boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony are uh, or were one on April 26th at 6 p.m. and the next one will be on June 2nd at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up the sh on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation and residence and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard or email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov or submit a two minute video of your testimony through a form on our website. For more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0480 to 0482, orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual app appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Dockets 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0484 to 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be Mayor's Office of Housing, MOH, Office of Fair Housing and Equity, OFHE. Our panelists today uh, in, for today's hearing are uh, Sheila Dillon, Chief of Housing, uh, Rick Wilson, Deputy Director, Administration and Finance, uh, Donald Wright, Deputy Director of Real Estate Management and Sales. Danielle Johnson, Deputy Director, Office of Housing Stability. Uh, for OFHE panelists, William Onoha. Oh, thank you. Director of Fair Housing. And uh, is it Thai Bells? Awesome. Chief of Staff, uh, Fair Housing and Equity. I am joined uh, by my colleagues, Councillor President Ed Flynn, Councillor Liz Braden, Councillor Ruzi Louisienne, Councillor Aaron Murphy, and Councillor Brian Worrell. For our format, um, I've been informed that you would prefer doing one presentation and then moving forward with questions together. Okay, so um, seeing that the panelists are, there are six of you, um, you may take up to 25 minutes for your presentation. Uh, you'll be timed and hear a timer upon that time. Just let me know if you need a couple more minutes. And then we'll do first round. Um, we can do the same as yesterday, so longer time. Okay, so for each round, we'll just do two rounds for each round, eight minutes each counselor, and in between, we'll do public testimony. Okay. Um, and now, uh, without further ado, I will turn to the floor for your presentation. Welcome and thank you.
Great. Thank you so much. And I will be as, as succinct as possible. Um, good morning, Councillor Fernandez Anderson and members of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding our fiscal year 23 budget. Sorry, Councillor, is the slide deck? Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, Carrie is probably working on. Do you have the remote, though? You do? OK. Um, thanks, Ms. Cora. One moment, please. Okay. Okay. Oh. Great. So for the record, my name is Sheila Dillon and I'm Chief of Housing uh, and Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing. Testifying with me today is Danielle Johnson, Deputy Director of the Office of Housing Stability, Donald Wright, uh, Deputy Director for Real Estate Management and Sales, Rick Wilson, Deputy Director for Administration and Finance. Donald, Rick, and I will be presenting and Danielle is here as the newest member of our leadership team to answer any questions about the Office of Housing Stability. We also have many other senior leadership here and including represent representatives from the BHA. So as you know, Councillors, uh, Mayor's Office of Housing work cuts across six strategic areas, creating and preserving affordable housing, ending homelessness, strengthening home ownership, supporting renters, and managing and disposing of city-owned property. And new for this year, the Grow Boston Initiative, which builds upon our grassroots program to promote urban agriculture, community gardens, and food production in the city. Before uh, turning it over to Donald and Rick, I'd like to take a few minutes to provide some highlights of our accomplishments this last year and our goals for the next fiscal year. First, uh, housing development. I know there's a lot of great, uh, there's a lot of great interest in this work. We've had tremendous success in the past year creating affordable housing with over 1,400 new income restricted units being permitted, including over 250 units for uh, housing for our seniors. Two of the recent projects are featured here. The photo on the right is Pride, the first LGBTQ friendly senior housing development in the former Barton Rogers School in Hyde Park. And the one on the left is 2147 Washington Street, right next to Haley House uh, in Nubian Square with affordable rental, home ownership units, including artist housing. We also awarded $45 million in our fiscal year 22 budget, supporting another, the creation of another 783 units and preserved uh, nearly 600 units of housing. Because while we have projects in construction, we are always working to build pipeline. And we've taken out uh, last year over 230 market rate units out of the speculative market uh, and they will become permanent deed restricted uh, housing. Looking forward to fiscal year 23, we'll continue to support the creation and preservation of affordable housing and double down on our real estate uh, acquisitions using city and federal funds. And we'll continue to recruit and support local MWBE developers for this development work. We will also seek to significantly increase resources for affordable housing by updating the linkage and inclusionary development policies. And we look forward to being, bringing those new policy ideas back to the city council and by lobbying for passage of the property transfer fee home rule petition, which this body supported several months ago. I know you're also interested in seeing how our spending is broken down by neighborhoods. So we've provided that for several of our programs might be a little hard to read, but um, you, you do have this information. This slide shows our affordable housing spending over the last four years. It gives a better snapshot broken down by city council district. As you can see, it is fairly well distributed across the city. Next, I want to talk a, a wee bit about homelessness and supportive housing. COVID-19 and the humanitarian crisis at Mass Cass has highlighted the importance for this work. In fiscal year 22, we've continued to house hundreds of homeless adults, veterans, youth, and families. We've also worked with the state and partner agencies to set up low threshold sites for the individuals that were living at the Mass Cass area. In addition, we've created over 360 new units of housing for homeless households with another 343 in the pipeline. Two very significant projects that you may be aware of, we're showing them here. 
3368 Washington Street in Jamaica Plain and 140 Clarendon Street in Back Bay. These are the biggest supportive housing projects in the city's history and both have services being provided by Pine Street Inn. Finally, earlier this year, we launched the Special Commission on Family Homelessness and that work is ongoing. In fiscal year 23, we're pushing to house 1,000 homeless individuals and we're gonna leverage all of our federal COVID and ARPA funding to significantly accelerate and increase production of supportive housing. We'll also issue updated and new plans to guide all of our homeless efforts. Next, very quickly, home ownership. We know how important home ownership is in addressing the inequities in housing and wealth in Boston. Over the past few years, we've expanded our support to home buyers through larger down payment assistance, uh, the launching of the One Plus Boston Mortgage Program, and the First Generation Home Buyer Match Savings Program. And as you can see, the vast majority of this assistance is going to households of color. We also continue to fund home repair and heating system projects, especially for our seniors, and provide foreclosure prevention services to hundreds of households every year. And this year, we used federal COVID funding to provide mortgage relief to homeowners impacted by the pandemic. In fiscal year 23, we'll continue to provide financial assistance to even greater numbers of first-time home buyers, especially if the ARPA funding is approved. And we'll push to move as many affordable home ownership projects into construction as possible, leveraging city land and federal funding. We have a healthy pipeline of over 500 units in pre-development on top of the 102 units that started construction this year. Again, counselors, this slide shows how our home buying financial assistance supports households across the city and is benefiting communities of color with 68% uh, of this funding going to BIPOC households. And the next slide shows the same for our home repair programs with 66% of our assistance going to BIPOC households and 69% of our funding going to Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury. As you know, Housing stability has been a huge focus of the Mayor's Office of Housing during the pandemic. We've distributed over $35 million to about 6,000 households through the Rental Relief Fund. And on top of that, we've served another 5,000 households with various services, including other financial assistance, legal assistance, um, just good guidance, uh, housing search. We've also launched the Rent Stabilization Advisory Committee to look at how other jurisdictions have implemented rent stabilization and make recommendations on how Boston may adopt such a policy. For fiscal year 23, we'll continue to spend down the rental relief fund and help at least 850 renters facing eviction and place 325 uh, households into permanent housing. We'll also use new city funding to expand eviction prevention services, outreach, and education. The next, this slide, yeah, I think it should be, next slide, thank you, um, shows how our rental relief funding spending is broken down by neighborhood and demographic groups. We've worked hard to ensure that every community of Boston can access this assistance by translating program materials, promoting it through every possible channel like Boston Public School Communications, and engaging neighborhood nonprofits to conduct outreach and assist renters completing the application. As a result, 75% of rental relief payments have gone to BIPOC households and really have served the, the, the neighborhoods typically most hard hit by evictions. Real estate management and sales, in addition to providing funding, surplus land is a critical uh, asset that we use to develop housing, community gardens, and open space. As you can see on the chart, nearly half of our 1,100 parcels are unavailable or undevelopable. It's always good to just give a summary of where we are with our inventory. Of the remaining over 500 parcels of land, over 200 parcels are in active disposition process. We're working with, I think, probably every one of your offices on some disposition process right now. We're very excited to be making real progress on the Blue Hill Avenue Action Plan, having designated five parcels to an NWBE developer and three to Habitat for Humanity. And we just issued the RFP for 18 more parcels along this important corridor. In fiscal year 23, we expect to sell or transfer at least 95 parcels of land. And we're working with the BPDA and other city agencies to identify all the parcels suitable for home ownership. Our hope is that through this effort and with ARPA funding, we can accelerate the disposition of land and create affordable home ownership opportunities. 
I'm wrapping up, I promise. As I mentioned earlier this year, we launched the Grow Boston program to promote food production and urban agriculture. Our successful grassroots community garden program will continue to be an important component of Grow Boston. In addition, we will work with the Office of Food Justice and other city departments to develop and implement new initiatives like rooftop gardens, raised beds in low and moderate income neighborhoods, and planting fruit trees on city-owned land. We will also work with city agencies to provide resources for home and community gardens, including technical assistance, educational programs, and gardening tools. We're very, very excited about, to get going on this work. I'm now going to turn this over to Donald Wright, who will briefly discuss some of our efforts to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Office of Housing, and then Rick Wilson will discuss our recommended budget. Thank you so much for your time. Donald. OBG. Good morning, Councilors. Good morning. For the record, I am Donald Wright, Deputy Director of Real Estate Management and Sales Divisions um, at uh, the Mayor's Office of Housing. I'd like to take a few moments to share with you our efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion. YW Boston is supporting MOH through their Inclusion Boston series, a change management process designed to help MOH audit current strengths, identify obstacles, and perform a root cause analysis of challenges. The Inclusion Boston cohort and mix of MOH staff uh, is participating in a series of five two-hour workshops uh, or, or dialogue sessions with the goal of coming up with a draft action plan which focuses on internal MOH culture, operations, and practices. And as far as contracting, this is an area that we focus and work on diligently throughout the agency. Out of 51, 51 active uh, fiscal year 22 contracts, 19 or 37 percent are MWBEs, 10 of whom are certified, 25, uh, uh, which is 51 percent, are Boston-based. Um, we will continue to work with our partners in the Office of Economic Opportunity to recruit and certify more uh, MOH contractors. We will also continue to provide technical assistance pre and post bid and RFP submission. A diversity and inclusion plan is required for all services, dispositions, and funding RFPs. In hiring this past year, we expanded and targeted outreach to attract diverse applicant pools. The use of partners such as the Builders of Color Coalition, uh, community partners, staff recommendations, and networks has also assisted us in that. In addition to outreach, we looked at our hiring practices and identified areas to improve by creating diverse hiring committees to review of blind resumes and uniform questions to address implicit bias. When it comes to language and communication access, we've also focused greatly on that. All meetings have interpretation services. We have translated program materials throughout all of the departments and an intensive use of the language line, which is second to, uh, to 311. I will now turn it over to Rick Wilson, who will present our FY23 recommended budget. Thanks, Donald. Good morning, Councilors. Good morning. Our, uh, so our FY23 budget proposal, I'll go through this very quickly, uh, is $41.9 million. That's our city operating funding, including the Housing 2030 Special Appropriation. That's an increase of $6.5 million over FY22, or about 18 percent, so uh, another year um, in a series of years of significant increases in funding for housing, which we are very excited about. Uh, there's a number of investments that make up that $6.5 million. The largest is $2.5 million for the City of Boston voucher program. That's, a two, that's uh, bringing total funding for that program to $7.5 million. That's administered by the BHA through a, a memorandum of agreement with our office. A little over a $1 million for housing and services for homeless individuals. Um, $800,000 for the Grow Boston program that Sheila uh, described earlier. Uh, and then additional investments for housing development and, and acquisitions housing stability services, um, some much needed repairs and improvements at the Strand Theater in Upham's Corner, um, and some additional staff capacity to support our work. Uh, the, this FY23 capital budget includes $72 million in housing projects. These are really BHA projects, but as they're listed in our section of the budget, uh, I thought I would mention them. Um, if you have questions, we can get the responses or bring up um, the representative from the BHA to address them. Um, there's uh, one project for the Mary Ellen McCormick um, development in South Boston and um, two uh, projects for the Mildred C. Haley houses in House in JP. As you know, counselors, most of our funding uh, comes from external sources. Uh, we expect $145 million in total spending from external sources for FY23. 
Um, the largest uh, chunk of that is from our one-time COVID relief funding, $45 million, um, which we are using for rental relief, homelessness, and housing development. Um, we once again got our biggest award ever in continuum of care funding, which supports our homelessness and supportive housing um, work. Uh, inclusionary development fund continues to be an important source for housing development and acquisitions. Uh, and the remaining funds here are our annual entitlement grants from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, nothing much to report there. Some little, some small increases, some small decreases, but essentially level of funding. And that's it. I'll turn it back to Sheila to wrap up, if you want. Yep. I'm I, I think that wraps up MOH's presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'll now tell, t I'm going to turn to my council colleagues for questions and. This is Fair Housing, I don't know if Fair Housing is going next. Oh, sorry. Sure. There were two. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. And we can uh, go next or we can wait till after you, questioning, whatever No, 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 we, we had agreed. I thought that was the whole thing. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Never. Okay. We had agreed. Uh, literally, I think I ran out of slides, so I thought I, I thought there was a. Do we have anything from you, any printout or anything? No, 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 just a couple of things I'll read into the record and that's about it. Okay. And then we'll yield for questioning. Okay, you have the floor. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, counselors. My name is Will Anoha. I am the executive director of the Office of Fair Housing and Equity. Thank you for having us this morning and I'll do my best to be as brief as possible. But I'll just read a couple of things into the record in the moment, at the moment just to explain the Office of Fair Housing and Equity to you. So the Office of Fair Housing and Equity is a guardian and promoter of equal housing opportunity in Boston. Our mission is to eliminate discrimination and ensure equitable access to housing opportunities, public services, public accommodations, and participation in activities. The office strives to reduce um, procedural, attitudinal, and communication barriers for persons living in the city of Boston. The basic functions of the office include, but are not limited to, Investigate reactive and proactive complaints of housing discrimination. Seek resolution of initial complaints. Seek disciplinary enforcement against respondents found guilty of, dis of discriminatory practices through monetary, educational, and restrictive sanctions. Partner with housing and development sister agencies to draft and implement uh, equitable housing policy. Conduct fair housing education and outreach training for landlords, property owners, real estate brokerage firms, housing agencies, real estate boards, and banks when needed. The office receives complaints in two ways, from the public complaints and from those initiated by our office, public complaints. Any resident living in the city of Boston can bring a complaint to our attention by one of the following ways, calling our office, emailing, or visiting um, us on our website, or by visiting in person. When contacting us, the residents should provide us with as much inf detailed information or do provide us with as much different inf information and evidence of the discriminatory act taken against them as possible. This includes, but is not limited to, written statements, pictures, voice recordings, internet postings, etc. We also do office initiating complaint, office initiated complaints, or better yet, commission of initiated complaints. In an effort to determine whether a housing provider is engaging in discriminatory practices, uh, the Office of Housing and Equity has partnered with, housing, with the Housing Discrimination Testing Program Clinic at Suffolk School of Law to conduct undercover testing of housing throughout the city of Boston. Discrimination testing relies on paired testing, a, method a methodology in which two testers assume the role of applicants with equivalent social and economic characteristics who differ only in terms of the characteristics being tested for discrimination, such as race, disability status, or source of income, rental voucher. Another word, another way, is, excuse me, another way of saying that is Section 8. Depending on which part of the housing transaction process is being tested, the match candidates may only request appointments from housing providers uh, or they may visit in person. Testers apply for housing anywhere in the city of Boston. However, their work is predominantly in white or affluent neighborhoods in order to provide irrefutable evidence of discriminatory, of discriminatory practice. Each test sample is tested between four and five times. It is important to point out that evidence provided by testers also benefits unbiased landlords by quickly dispelling false claims of discrimination. So in other words, it cuts both ways. 
Um, when discriminatory practices are found, OFHE will assume, will, sorry, excuse me, OFHE will issue a complaint against housing providers on the behalf of the city of Boston as the complainant or injured party um, and prosecute such cases before the Boston Fair Housing Commission. At this, at this point, OFHE seeks financial sanctions against housing providers, including civil and compensatory damages um, beginning at $10,000. In addition, OFHE seeks to require mandatory educational training on fair housing laws provided by the Office of Fair Housing and Equity. In the event that a respondent appeals the decision of the Boston Fair Housing Commission, the Attorney General becomes the complainant of, on the behalf of the Commission and litigates such cases. Should this happen, the testing provides necessary evidence to support the conclusion that there are sufficient disputed issues of material fact to defeat a summary judgment motion and require determination by the terrier fact in pattern or practice cases and in individual cases. It's important to note that in order to prove a housing discrimination suit in a rental context in Massachusetts, complaint, complainants must show that they, one, are a member of a protected class, two, have attempted to apply for an apartment for which complainants are qualified and and also that respondents are seeking applicants. And three, were deterred from applying under circumstances given rise to an, rise to an rate, give rise to an inference of unlawful discrimination. At this point, I will turn it over, I will yield for questioning and um, anything that the council might wanna know further about our office. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Councillor President Flynn, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your important leadership that you're providing. Um, thank you to the panelists for being here and for your leadership as well. Um, thank you, Sheila, and just want to start off the AOP Acquisition Opportunity Program. What is the status of that as we emerge from the from the pandemic, what are we what are we looking at, and what is the short term um, challenges you see, in, and maybe the long term challenges you see as well? So it's a great question. Um, so the acquisition opportunity program remains a very very important part of our work. Um, we anticipate spending our fiscal year twenty three budget and ARPA if that's approved on more acquisitions. I think the biggest challenge is. Um, we face is uh, getting more entities interested in participating in the program, one, and two, the, the cost of the acquisitions. There's a lot of specu speculation right now in Boston, as we all know, unfortunately. So in, like in your district, Chinatown, the Asian CDC is trying to uh, you know, actively go after buildings and they're um, being snapped up by developers thinking that they're going to be able to build you know, very, very large uh, labs or resident market rate residential. So competing with the market, I think, and getting more people interested in the program. But this program, not to go on too long, but I just love this program so much because it, it, it creates permanent uh, affordable housing, but it also preserves tenancies and keeps the tenants in place. So it really, it accomplishes two wonderful things. Thanks. Thank you, and yes, I actually reached out to several organizations uh, before the hearing. One of them was ACDC, uh, but the other one was the Chinatown Land Trust, and they brought both brought up to me the importance of the um, AOP program. So just want to say thank you to uh, Chinatown Land Trust and ACDC, along with other, with other organizations that are doing tremendous work. Um, so how does, Sheila, how does the, uh, federal funds we're getting, APA funds, are we, are we able to include more of that funding into housing assistance for residents in need, especially uh, seniors or, or persons with disabilities? Sure, so um, there is a, a plan to spend a significant amount of the ARPA funding 
I think, are you referring to the ARPA funding council? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on, on housing, both um, bricks and sticks, building a lot more affordable housing, uh, doing acquisitions, but also providing support through the Office of Houses, Housing Stability for seniors and, and our disabled community. Um, so yes, yes to all of the above. And I'm you know, very thankful of the commitment. I look forward to coming back and, and um, participating with all of you on, on uh, hearing on how to, how to best spend that resources. But I think the Wu administration has made it very clear that housing is one of our number one issues and we should be investing, uh, we should be investing most of the ARPA money on housing issues. And um, Shell, what are we doing? I, I'm, I mean, I know what we're doing, but um, what, are, what are some of the plans going forward on assisting homeless veterans? Um, and, and one of the qu qu questions I had is, uh, were we able to identify any homeless veterans in and around the Mass and Cass area during, during this critical time? There was, um, very specifically, uh, the people that doing, were doing the outreach, both in the tents and for folks just are down there, asked that question routinely because uh, homeless vets do have resources available to them that are unique to other, you know, just our general homeless population. Uh, some were identified and some were um, put in touch with New England Center for Homeless Vets, the VASH program, and our own Vets Commission. So yes, there weren't many. There were a handful, Commissioner, that at least people identifying themselves as vets. There was only a few, but they were, they were identified and offered services. Thank you, and I know I had the opportunity to talk to Congressman Stephen Lynch over the weekend. I know we, he was able to work with the congressional delegation securing funds for New England Center for Homeless Veterans, which, which, is a, which plays a critical role in our city. Um, um, Madam Chair, do I, do I still have another minute or am I done? Oh, no, you have four oh, minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And th again, thank you to the panelists. Will, thank you for your testimony as well. Appreciate it. Um, what are we seeing in terms of any discrimination towards persons with disabilities? Uh, we're seeing a lot of rents going up as we, as we come out of this pandemic, but what are we seeing in terms of potential discrimination or discrimination against persons with disabilities, um, pe uh, persons of color and people of color and um, Immigrants so, as well across the city. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, persons with disabilities tends to be discrimination against persons with disabilities tends to be one of the highest case, one of the higher cases that we see in our office, followed by um, um, source of income, which would be um, individuals that are, are voucher holders, or Section Eight voucher holders, and then followed by uh, race. Um, during the pandemic in, tw in fiscal year 2022 or calendar year 2021, if you will, when it had began, one of the things we did see was an uptick in um, discrimination against um, immigration, excuse me, immigrants, especially those that belong to the AAPI community. And we definitely took those cases and um, resolved all of those cases, Counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, and I know Sheila mentioned it, and it's an issue I've worked on for five, four or five years. But the VASH program is a is a federal is a federal program that provides um, housing assistance to to veterans, rental rental assistance <coughs> rental assistance to veterans similar to Section Eight. But do we see any discrimination against um, anyone holding a VASH voucher? Oh, I'm sorry, can, can you ask? Can Do we see any discrimination against a veteran holding a VASH voucher that wants to use that to secure housing or to stay in housing? That isn't, that it, we don't have high numbers of those, but um, it does happen, but that, that's not something we have a high caseload on. Okay. <clears throat> if, if we have anything, any information on that, could you let me know? But also if you have any cases um, about any veteran being discriminated against that has a VASH voucher, if you could let me know that as well. Um, and then, then the final question I have, I know you, you mentioned that there's a high percentage of, or high number I should say, of tenants that are AAPI um, that, are, that have been victims of discrimination 
do we do we know the answer why that why AAPI members are victims of discrimination in housing? Do we? I mean, I have a I have an idea why, but do we document the reason why? I mean, what I can tell you is based on what we saw during the pandemic, it was in response to a lot of the negative rhetoric that was. Um, put out there regarding COVID-19 and, you know, calling it the Wuhan virus, all that kind of thing. And so due to the negative rhetoric that was placed out there, the uh, AA AAPI community suffered greatly. And obviously, discrimination was rose in that particular category because of very, very disparaging and um, negative information that was, that was centered around the pandemic. No, th thank you, Will. And again, thank you to the <coughs> administration team that's testifying. Thank you for your leadership. Um, Madam Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here this morning. Um, housing is the number one issue in Alston Brighton. We did a constituent survey a few months ago. We had 250 respondents, and housing was top of the list. Um, uh, housing affordability and um, Alston Brighton is home to a very mixed bag of, of residents. We have a lot of students. Um, Boston has 153,000 students and um, that, that puts incredible pressure on our housing, housing stock. Uh, I just wonder um, how long should our neighbourhoods be expected to accommodate large numbers of students without colleges doing more to provide affordable, affordable on-campus housing. And, you know, and just as in Berkeley, California, they're, they're looking at caps on enrollment. Uh, are we at that stage yet, or how do we, how do we mitigate the impacts of um, huge numbers of students on our housing stock? Um, the other question I had was, uh, we're building millions of square feet of uh, lab space across the city. Uh, concentrated in a few districts, certainly Alston Brighton is seeing a, a pretty heavy uh, impact. Um, how many how many jobs will these lab spaces generate, and how much housing will we need to support all this new industry coming in? Um, you know, when I'm begging for an, a, a district-wide master plan for Alston Brighton so that we can sort of manage some of this, but uh, that's that's always a perennial question. Um, and then, um, let's see, I know that the Faneuil Gardens um, housing is, is uh, slated for rehabilitation and addition of some new homes. Uh, I wonder, is there, do we have a timeline for the Faneuil Gardens? Um, I don't see any reference to it in this, in this year's budget so far. Um, I know it went out to, uh, for an RFP, um, but I just wondered, like some more information on um, on the timeline. Um, and then fair housing and equity, the family housing is a big issue. Um, I can honestly say that in Alston Brighton, when developers build huge developments uh, and we ask about family housing, they just look at us like we're from another planet um, and laugh. Because you know, the, the IDP units that we were getting up until fairly recently were studios and one bedrooms. Uh, thankfully, we're managing to get more three-bedroom units uh, designated in the, uh, in the affordable uh, bracket, but again, it is something that we need to really do more on. Um, and then the other question I had was with regard to, you know, so much of our family homes have been bought up by um, speculative investors uh, to rent out to students and young professionals in our district. Um, I'd love to get some metrics on uh, deleting programs because one of the the default uh, position for a, um, a landlord is they jack the rent, they put the rent at such a such a price point that families can never couldn't possibly afford it, and then they're able to um, uh, avoid having to mitigate lead in the in their homes because they're not renting specifically to families, and again I think that's a workaround that. Um, makes it really difficult for our uh, um, low income and working families to to find a home in Alston Brighton and we do have cases of multiple families sharing a, a single you know, sharing apartments um, because that's the only way they can afford to live in Alston Brighton and it's not it's not good enough so 
that's my first uh, crack at the questions. <laughs> Thank you. I can try to answer some of those, and, and I, uh, Joel Wool is here to talk about, he could talk about Faneuil Gardens. So um, I agree, um, the, students, the students in Boston are both a blessing, but I don't want to say they're a curse, so, that, that's, <laughs> so I, I'll take that back. But um, they're, they're wonderful and they add to Boston in so many ways, but they do strain our housing, our housing uh, stock. I am very excited about uh, the BPDA getting a new director. Um, for lots of reasons, but one of them is because I think um, that I think we need to take the institutional master planning for each college and university, um, and we need to really look at like their housing, their housing goals, where their students are living. We have the data, and and start really having much more robust conversations about what is in their master plan. And I think until we start doing that with some expectation, um, we're not going to see real improvement. We have we have seen uh, a colleges and universities build more dormitories, but that pipeline too has slowed. So I think we need to start having some very honest conversations with them. Um, you mentioned lab space, and we right now, uh, and I will have this information soon, we are working with the BPDA and the MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, on new uh, pro population projections. And part of those projections have got to take into um, effect the, the, the proliferation of new lab space and what that is going to do to our population and what income are those folks going to have. Not everybody working in a lab is, is, is making uh, high salaries. So we need to incorporate that into our, our new uh, population projections. We're hoping to have that soon, and I can share that with you as soon as we have it. Um, the, the investor... The investors buying our housing stock, it's a, now it's becoming a national phenomena. We've had it for a long time here that investors buy our multifamily properties that were once would house extended families. So as you know, we were working with the Alston Brighton CDC on a program where they would purchase properties. They would put a deed restriction of homeowner of owner occupancy on them. Um, and they would, they would turn around and sell for a slight discount. And I think we need to figure out how to grow this program and take more units out of the speculative market. I truly do. But it is related, once again, to making sure our colleges and universities are housing affordably more people on campus. Um, I'm going to ask Joel if he could answer uh, questions on Faneuil Gardens. Uh, good. Let's see, is it on? Not sure that I can hear it here, but um, yeah. come on. Okay. Come sit in the hot seat, Joe. Hot seat, Joe. <laughs> uh, good morning, um, Madam Chair. Good morning, members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name is Joel Wool. I'm chief of staff at the Boston Housing Authority. Always good to be back here. Um, Councillor, I know that you're so involved with our, the public housing in your district, and we're always appreciative of the partnership. Um, and the first, the first date that comes to mind, um, I know that we uh, have a meeting on the books with you and the, um, the rep for the area for early June to talk a little bit about the planning process forward. But I do want to just give a little background um, for some colleagues on on the council um, briefly. Um, so Faneuil Gardens is one of our state public housing sites. Um, it's, it's a really wonderful community. Uh, we, are, we have different resources and options available to our state and federal public housing properties. We've been looking at opportunities to help um, modernize some of our state portfolio, and Faneuil is, is one that is uh, likely right for that. In discussion with the Tenant Association there, um, BHA moved forward with the initial uh, planning grant um, and some some conceptual modeling um, with with the HCD, and then um, subsequently um, with the tenants uh, tenant leadership on the selection committee, did put out an RFP looking for development services for that area uh, for that development. Um, the the community sort of public planning process for that has not. Uh, fully kicked off, although as noted, the tenants have been involved from jump um, in, in terms of uh, helping to select. And I know from participating in those meetings that part of what they were 
looking for in, 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 in the nonprofit developer that was selected um, was really that they didn't come in with a fully baked plan, a number of units or, or anything else there, um, but really came in and said, we're gonna listen to the people who live here today about how you wanna see as we move forward and modernize the units. So, Councilor, thanks for, and, and that I know you're familiar with. I do wanna just, for the, for the full body, um, share a little information. I think we, we can expect um, a couple of things. One is that um, we will have in our, I think, more, more official meetings, of course, with the elected delegation uh, and the tenants from the area um, kicking off early June. Um, and, that, and, and from there, open up a more public planning process. Simultaneously, we do have, BHA did um, put in a funding application to the DHCD. Um, we're in dialogue about that. There's not a result there. I think that would ultimately somewhat impact the timing as well as um, feedback we get from when we open it up. But I think within this calendar year, you would see a more um, public planning uh, process commence. Um, so I'll stop there and just see if there's any other specific questions that I can answer with my no, brief that, time here. That, I appreciate that, Joel, and it's good to have a, an update. And um, I think working with the Tenants Association and and visioning what they like to see, it is a wonderful community over there, and I hope that we can improve their housing situation because it is pretty challenging. Not having hot water sometimes is not, not fun. <laughs> so they, they're really... It really is a project that has got some urgency, and I hope we can move it forward in a timely way. Yes, and I and I did just want to say it's a site that we're we're over all the time dealing with for the, um, you know the the boilers and things and, and such. And um, it is it, it's it's a site that has underground store. It's 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 one of the dirtiest and most outdated I think heating systems generally, and, and so it, you know in 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 addition to modernizing the units that are there for residents, I think I have some hope that we can. Uh, do great things there, uh, not just on the reliability of, of um, critical services that people need um, to live in, you know, have a decent quality of life, but also um, with the city's sustainability goals. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the project ahead. <laughs> Good, and we appreciate working with you on that, and yeah. thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Council Braden. Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to members of the administration for being here and for uh, all of your work on what is a very difficult issue, which is how do we make sure we house everyone in the city of Boston. Um, I want to well, piggyback off of a question that Councillor, uh, that um, President Flynn was asking about acquisition opportunity program. I also think that it's a really incredible program. Um, my understanding is that under AOP, we can subsidize about $75,000 per unit and there's case by case variation where we would subsidize maybe 100,000 per unit. But that still requires, um, you know, if we're talking about nonprofit buyers, if we're talking about community land trust, there's still that really big gap of capital to really compete with the speculative market. Um, and so I'm wondering, and, and also we don't have really good data in terms of like the number of units that have been preserved under the AOP and at what AMIs. Um, and what are the demographics, really, of those who have been, um, you know, who's had, who've had their, you know, their housing protected and uh, wh whose housing we've been able to stabilize? Yeah. And was wondering if we have, if we could have that information or that data. So you, Rick may have it, so be, would be glad to hear it and to think about, like, what, if one of the things we need to do is provide further sustainable funding for AOP, um, can we do that and, and what will be the source of funding for that? Thanks, Council. Yeah, we, I mean, we have uh, you know lots of data on AOP. We have lots of data on all of our programs. Um, just at a very high level, I can tell you that so far since the program's inception, we have uh, awarded $62 million to the AOP program. Um, 45 of that has already been committed uh, to projects for acquisitions. Um, with that funding, we've, we've supported the acquisition of 68 buildings and 684 restricted units across the city. So it's just been a you know, wildly successful program. In the first uh, allocation of, AR, of ARPA funding that the city council approved last year, we got, I think, $20 million um, for AOP. That, that's in process right now. That's part of what Sheila talked about during her, her presentation earlier. Um, and there's additional funding in the ARPA request that will be before um, the uh, Councilor Box Committee uh, soon. Um, so, uh, you know, like Sheila said, and this has just been, it's a 
amazing program. Everybody loves the program. It's working very well. Um, but as far as more detailed breakdowns, we can we can provide that too. Yeah, just curious in terms of like, are we you know are we are we really getting at like the you know the forty percent AMIs, the six fifty sixty? That's yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll get that. Um, we. Uh, we certainly house and continue to house anyone who is living there in the building at the you know at the time of the acquisition. I think though it's I will get you the information on the affordability levels for any vacant units or units that we anticipate turning over. We can get that for you. Thank you. Um, I also know that the mayor's office of housing has done really great work. Um, you know, I think there was that Morton Village example of where we were able to help you know tenants, uh, a, a private uh, buyer ensure rent affordability. I was wondering, are we able, are there more models of us being able to do that? Um, if, you know, how are we supporting tenant associations that are really trying to do that work? So we do through C our partner CDAC, we do have um, the BTOP program that we fund and they give money to tenant organizers to actually organize buildings because <clears throat> we don't have the staff capacity to actually, you know, go and door knock. Um, but we attend a lot of tenant meetings and, and certainly support them. I think as many uh, it, to, we, we need to continue to fund because there's not a lot of funding sources for organizing efforts. And then with the hope that those organizing efforts end up with the tenants uh, being able to stay in their homes and have someone purchase them and convert it to long-term affordability. We were very excited in the last legislative session that um, that we passed TOPA, Tenant Opportunity Purchase. We all worked on it. We were very excited that, you know, if a building was being sold and it was occupied, tenants had a right to purchase their building. It was one of the happiest days of my work, my professional life, mm -hmm. and the governor vetoed it. So now yeah. it's, it's again at the state legislature, and we're hoping for passage this time, although the governor is making, you know, overtures that he may that he may veto again if it does pass. So, but we need those kind of tools to ensure that that tenants can actually purchase the property and stay competitive. Thank you. And just so that I'm clear, what other sources of funding that we have right now to support the tenant organizing organizing work? I, I'll, I'll get that back to you. I'll get back to you on that. I don't know exactly the source that we provide CDAC through the BTOP program, but I'll I'll, I'll run that down. Okay. Um, another question is about the Housing Stability Notification Act, which this body passed, um, something that I care deeply about, and I know Danielle and many others care deeply about, is how do we really prevent displacement on the front end from that point of your landlord informing you that they want you out? A lot of people t interpret that as, oh, I must leave, without realizing what their like legal rights are to really fight an eviction. So I'm wondering if, and I think it was passed in 2020, so I don't know if you've had data from the pandemic, but has it had a material impact on uh, vulnerable populations uh, that face displacement staying in their homes? Wait till it gets red, solid, solid red, and then you can. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your question. Uh, we can definitely get the data for you on that, but it has been clear that that program has been beneficial. We've been able to uh, um, avert evictions by getting this information, reaching out to tenant and landlord through our various programs. We have a mediation program where landlords and tenant uh, can have a conversation. Is that derivative of this? Is that mediation program? Was that correct? Tied to? Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, where landlord and tenant can have a conversation well before you even get to the summary process housing court action. Um, and being able to communicate with landlords to see exactly what it is that they need. If it's rental assistance, we can provide that um, for them. If it is condition issues, we can also step in and assist with that. So being able to actually see these notices to quit that come in. We can also uh, see if they're actually legit in terms of legal uh, action. You know, there are certain mm -hmm. requirements that are uh, supposed to be on notices to quit. So we're able to confer with landlords on that before they even get to um, housing court. And even if we do get to the housing court stage, we do have a housing court uh, navigator program where we are again able to step in and see how we can utilize any type of financial assistance or other types of resources. Great. I'm just curious what you think the gaps still are because I'm, I just I still get calls from my office yep. to my office from people sure. like I have to leave. Yep. My landlord's telling me and they don't have to leave. So if there's an information or communication gap, what like what what more do we have to do to to, to spread the word to folks? Correct. I, and I agree. There is uh, in addition to the information gap, there's a digital divide. So a lot of our information is online. Um, 
and we're having to reach out to tenants, you know, going to where the tenants are, meeting tenants where they are. That's something that our office is currently working on doing, um, but also making sure that landlords are aware of their responsibilities as landlords. So we've recently uh, started a small landlord workshop uh, where we're talking about these types of issues, you know, what you can and cannot do as a landlord, uh, and making sure that they're equipped with the information because a lot of times they may be giving the wrong information to their to their tenants. Great. Uh, a related question is in the mayor's office. I saw in the in the deck that um, one of the mayor's office housing housing is one of the top users of the language line. I was curious what capacity building you're doing internally to make sure that that language ability exists, that language diversity, um, can, which can help close communication gaps. How, what are we doing internally? Both, you know, we could also talk about what we're doing to build capacity in terms of, you know, uh, diverse uh, workers in MOH. Um, I care about that as well. I care, you know, with who we're contracting. Like to know, it says, I think it says, out of the 51 active contracts, 37% are MWBEs. Are those like the small contracts? Like, what does that tend to look like? Who are they? So, you know, I care a lot about the language access question because I think it is, I think, I, I think that's a big gap of who we miss when we're talking about undocumented folks. We're talking about our immigrant communities who don't know their rights when it comes to uh, their tendencies and who face displacement at higher rates. Again, agreed. Uh, we have a great team where we can send translation services to them to make sure any materials that we are sending out are in the language to the community that we're trying to reach, uh, whether it's the Haitian community, whether it's the Spanish community. We're really trying to make sure that any information that we are disseminating, that our uh, constituents have access to that information. So whether it's mailing documents, whether it's talking on the phone, using the language line, we're really um, interested in the same um, uh, vestitures that you are in terms of making sure that our constituents are able to understand whatever information that we're, we're putting out there. Great. And I have, I'll, I'm, um, I, I'm interested to hear what we're doing internally what, you know, at MOH to build that capacity too, but we can talk about it more on my second round. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chief Dillon, and your team. Um, you have helped our team um, place homeless families on several occasions already, so I do want to shout out to your team. Um, also, the mayor's office, Kate 40 and Food Justice um, have all been very helpful and responsive. As you know, um, you get here into this job and you get all sorts of calls. Some are to plant a tree and others are mom calling that she has nowhere to sleep that night or we've gotten calls and you've been very helpful around families who are placed in housing, but the housing is subpar, or you know, there's rats and no food, so thank you for that, and we'll continue to work together on that. I have a couple questions and then a couple statements. Um, my team attends weekly the Nubian Square Task Force meeting, and some of the concerns that have come up there are they're seeing more displacement from the Atkins Street area, um, and I don't want to spend any time talking about those who we've already placed, because I know we've talked about that, but is there a plan in place as we see a need for more housing there? Also, um, as a member of the Boston Commission on Ending Homelessness and as a BPS teacher, I do know for over 20 years how traumatic and it is when and disruptive for children if their family is struggling, struggling with home security. Um, and if you could speak to the challenges we face there and if your thoughts on if we have effective plans in place now or what more we can do as a council to advocate for more supports there. Um, President Flynn did touch on it, so I don't want to reiterate, but I'm thanking him for um, bringing up the veterans. We've gotten several calls, particularly around African-American veterans. And if there are any special housing supports for them, special in the sense, I mean, they deserve it, they're veterans, so I don't mean extra. Um, if you could speak to that. Um, and happy to see the investment in Grow Boston. We know that those who suffer from home insecurity often suffer from food insecurity, and healthy food is so important for their well-being, mental health, and all, so thank you for that. And just one question, why is there um, a half million dollars in your budget for the Strand Theater repair? It's just interesting that it showed up in your budget, so just that question would be great. So thank you. Sure. Let me see if I can tick off some answers and anything you feel you want um, more. We can certainly get you more information. 
Um, agree that there are folks leaving the mass cast area and, and making their way to the Nubian, that, that whole stretch. Um, we are talking, <clears throat> excuse me, we are talking to our nonprofit partners right now, especially Pine Street, who has a, like a, a, one of the best street outs programs um, you know, probably in the country about expanding. Um, we, they, because of, you know, they, there's never enough. They go to areas where there's hot spots, but we do need to, uh, I think we need to find funding for them to really grow their street outreach. Now, the street outreach is done, not just making sure people are safe, but they're also working with them on housing solutions. So those conversations are happening right now. Um, it's something the mayor is very supportive. We really do need better street outreach for our homeless populations throughout the city, every single corner. Um, so I can report back on that very soon. Um, agree about homeless families in their BPS. There's nothing more disruptive than a, a child in school than homelessness. Data shows it. We know it. We know it in our hearts, right? Um, the BPS was doing a, a great job in the last year when they uh, were able to secure more housing vouchers from HUD and they made them available to PPS fam families that were homeless or housing insecure at, at our public schools. Love to think about how to grow that and continue that program, especially with the increase in city vouchers that we're, we're asking for in this, in this, um, in this budget. There, there are so many families that either need a voucher or they need access to an affordable housing unit, and they're both in short supply. And um, even if we can help them sustain or pay the rent in a market rate unit, <clears throat> some of those rents are just beyond what a, what a family can pay. So I would say we need to continue really reaching out through the BPS schools and making vouchers available and uh, additional affordable housing with supports. Um, last year, we were able to house 120 homeless veterans, um, which is great. We still have some unique resources for that population. The shelters uh, continue to, and, and folks that working in the street, continue to identify veterans that are in shelter and, and really uh, uh, hook them up with very specific resources. The numbers in shelter, uh, because of this work, is pretty low, which is really good news. We have very, one is too many, but we have fewer homeless veterans than we ever have in, in the history of this, uh, since I've been doing this work. But we need to continue be, to be vigilant and continue to identify the vets living in the shelter and make sure they're availing themselves of, of these resources. Um, so more street, certainly more street outreach, um, continuing to work very close with BPS on our homeless families that are in the school system and continuing to be very, very vigilant with our homeless vets and making sure that they're either accessing VASH vouchers, uh, resources we have through our Veterans Commission, or the vets housing we've been able to build. One of the things um, Rob often tells me, Rob Santiago, is we have the best um, supports for our veterans, but so many of our veterans don't know or are, are aware of them, so I, we have, definitely have to do a better job outreaching of yeah. all of them. Agreed. Yeah. We have improved our relationship with the VA over the, over the last several years. Um, they, are, they make the recommendation on who gets a VASH voucher, so it's it's their they administer the program and they provide the names for the vash, vash vouchers are, are gold right you you get a rental subsidy for for life, so we've been now able to meet with them on a very regular basis and identify Boston residents that are in our shelters or that are very unstable, give them those names for them to prioritize. So that that link is tighter than it has been. Awesome, thank you. And if you could just touch on the Strand Theater. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Councillor, I, I, it is a little confusing. So uh, MOH, we actually own and, and maintain the Strand Theater, and we work with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture on the programming for the theater. Okay. It's Don Donaldstein, his staff, is actually the, mm -hmm. the folks who, who, who maintain it. So we, we put in the request for the repairs, and that's why it's in our budget. Okay. I mean, I love it, and I love the painting and the repairs that are happening there. My mom worked there when I was little, so when I would run around the theater as a little kid. Yeah, we've done some, some really great work. I was actually thinking about this last night. And in the midst of COVID, we were able to do a pseudo beautification project there where we did the murals mm -hmm. on the exterior doors. Yep. And that's by finding some, you know, some youth in our summer program and through success link. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look at the work that was done. And so what the pride, the levels these kids can go by yeah, every day and say, you know, I was a part of that. 
the Globe even uh, had, had written a story on it. So, I saw that, yeah. But we, uh, we manage it really well through its highs and lows. We continuously work with the programming staff there to make sure that they can continue operations without interruption. But there are some major things that need to be done in the Strand. And, and to that point, I've been making that request for a little while, and we were, so, you know, we were looking for uh, an owner-operator of the Strand, as, you, as mm -hmm. you're well aware. And, and so you, you have to sort of manage, you know, projects with kid gloves, but making sure that uh, programming, you know, persists and go forward, that's the, the main goal there. Right. Thank you. Yep. Chair, I'm all set. There you go. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Um, shout out to Chief Dillon, uh, Will, uh, Donald, um, <clears throat> Julio, Shauna, uh, and John, all great team, always being responsive and collaborative. I appreciate you know, your assistance. Um, one question is I have is around senior home repair. Um, we know that senior home repair uses HUD funding, um, and therefore it's not accessible to seniors with their home in a trust. Um, have we explored any other funding streams that we can make sure that it's able to be available for seniors to have their home in a trust. I'm gonna invite Richard O'Brien to come down and address that. It's a, it's a good question and I've heard it before but I don't have a, a, a good answer, so, um, but. Good morning, Councilors. Uh, my name is Richard O'Brien, I'm the Associate deputy for the Boston Home Center. Um, specific to your question, Counselor, uh, trusts are a problem because of, we have to, HUD's requirement is that we establish ownership. And once we've established ownership, we have to income qualify the owners. So trusts make that a little complicated. We are able to, uh, in some instances, substitute the funding source, right? So we'll use 2030 money if, if possible. Um, and in other instances, uh, for example, the Senior Save program, because the funding for the grant doesn't come from HUD, the HUD CDBG funding, we're able to allow the grant to go forward in the Senior Save program, which is a very substantial number. Um, so those are the funding constraints we work with. Um, it's further constrained when it comes to CDBG in that we have to apply the Title 10 Lead Safe Housing Rule. So um, when you go into a senior's home who may have 30, 40, 50 years of deferred maintenance and they want to do the kitchen or the bathroom and we need to tell them because of the Lead Safe Housing Rule, they need to empty every closet in their house uh, and we have to inspect every painted surface in the house. It's difficult, it's conflicting at times. So we do in those cases uh, grant those, uh, let's say, housing rule costs when it's impossible to go forward, uh, empty all the closets, inspect all the paint, we'll look to then substitute the funding source uh, when funds are available, when alternative funds are available. It's a case-by-case -case basis, it's challenging. Awesome, and then, um other question for the home center. I know a lot of the applications are done by paper, um, and it's sometimes hard to track when you know applicants are calling in to the home center. Have we explored using a portal so that way applicants can upload their docs? Because it's also a lot of information. I think it's like W nines, right. tax papers, um, a whole uh, packets of information. Certainly. You know, again, HUD regulation, right? So we have to follow the eligibility requirements. Um, there's a multitude of ways for an application to find its way to us, mm -hmm. uh, chiefly for the seniors is through the nonprofit agencies that we uh, have under contract, the four nonprofits around the city, the goal being that that extends our reach into those sub-neighborhoods where people might feel more comfortable with ESAC, Kit Clock, NOAA. Um, that's, for seniors, they're most comfortable with that, that handwritten application. Um, there does exist a, uh, an online application process, uh, which we see more often with homeworks. Um, but, you know, we, uh, quite frankly, during, you know, COVID, we had a lot of paper moving around and people were working at home and 
Uh, that presented a little bit of a challenge with through that now. We have a lot of new staff. We've tracked down all of those applications, made sure that they're in Salesforce, uh, and we're, we're capable to answer questions on any specific uh, application should, should that happen. Um, yeah, I would love to see like online so that applicants could go online just to see what information has been missing, where they're at in the process. Sure. Um, we, I can forward that information to you or we can follow up afterwards. Okay. Sure. And then um, I get this question might be for the chief. chief. Yeah, I see and that. thank you. <laughs> No, I, I do like that idea of someone going on and checking to see, because we, we, we all use that, right? Your right. application's complete except we're still missing this. So let's explore that. I like that. Awesome. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, back in December, the mayor announced the start of an audit of all city um, property. Yeah. Uh, can you update us on the status? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the BPDA, they, uh, the mayor asked the BPDA to look at what Mayor's Office of Housing owned, the BPDA owned, schools, uh, the BHA, um, and they are very close to having that done and then prioritizing actions around it. So I think you'll have something, I would say, within the next several weeks. Oh, awesome. Um, and then love to, you know, get some more information, you know, regarding the acquisition opportunity program. Sure. Yep. Um, and That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor, wait. Councillor Bach, were you here first? Yes. Before Council Lara? No, she's not. Okay. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much. Um, Chief Dillon and all the members of the cabinet and the directors for being here today. Um, I have a few questions. I, let's see, where do I start? So one of the things that I'm most concerned about, and this is, this is less of a question, but I want to start off with this. One of the things that I'm most concerned about uh, in terms of looking at this budget is really making sure that our investments are in alignment with the need that we have in the city. And so in preparation for the hearing that we held on IDP, I requested information regarding housing need in the city, specifically about um, data on waiting list for affordable units, income restricted units, section eight vouchers, public housing units, how many individual people we currently have living in shelters and how many families are currently living in shelters and the approximate number of people in the city who are homeless. Uh, we haven't received those answers yet. Okay. And I think for me, it's been difficult to kind of gauge whether or not we're making proper investments with this budget without knowing what the need is for the people that are in the city. Um, obviously you have a lot of work to do. So, um, a timeline for when can it, for when we can expect those numbers um, would be sufficient from from our office and for for the committee. So I just wanted to to start with that. Um, from the selected performance goals that you have on the budget, two uh, only two out of the seven are related to um, stabilizing renters, and we are a majority renter city, which means that most of the work that's happening in the mayor's office of housing is ultimately happening is stabilizing homeowners. Uh, and making home ownership more accessible, which is great, but I don't think it's responding to the need that we have right now. Can you share a little bit about how you decided um, on the goals that were presented in your narrative? Um, I know that we've, we've got production goals. We have goals to uh, uh, increase the percentages of home ownership in the city. Um, we, we certainly are very, very focused on making sure that our eviction numbers are, are, are lower, um, and that is really one of the, the benchmarks that, that we use. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to follow exactly what you mean by we, the goals, sorry. Uh, at the beginning of the narrative, there are, for the cabinet, you have selected performance goals. There are seven of them. Uh, one of them under real estate oh. management and sales, and then um, the other six under housing development and I services. See. I yeah. see. I can read them off if it's easier. Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. Sorry. No, I just haven't looked at these in a little bit. Please, but please, thank you. Thank you. You are correct. They read home ownership heavy. They do. <laughs> they're, 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 I think they're, um, they're more statements and actual goals with metrics, okay. but uh, I'd be glad to. 
as a follow-up, and I will get you the information on wait list by the end of the week. Um, I will, as a, as a follow-up, uh, give you much more specific goals and um, actions that we plan on taking in this year, this fiscal year, on, on our renter population. While we, you know, there's, there's always competing demands for resources uh, and energy, but um, making sure our renters can stay and do not face eviction is, is of you know, utmost importance. But let me get you some better information on that, and Thank I will you. do that soon. And so in the vein of production goals, I see here that you have a number of low-income units permitted right, for deed restricted and IDPS 548, and the number of middle income housing units permitted deed restricted and market as 1419. One of the questions that I have is how many public housing um, units are we building this year? And how many units of affordable housing at 30 to 60% AMI mm -hmm. are being built this year? And so I'm curious which one of these numbers will fall under there, or if any of these numbers answer my question. So I can say, and I'll find it, um, last year, fiscal year 22, we, we permitted Mayor's Office of Housing 1,025 um, new units of housing, mm -hmm. and I do have the under 30% AMI. I mean, just I just need to find it. Do you have that? I do. Take me a minute. Okay, I do have it. Great. Um, so last year of the um, 1,400 units that were permitted, 32% mm -hmm. uh, or 462 were, would be made available to households making less than 30% of AMI. Um, and then 30 to 60% AMI were 361. Now, most of the more middle income units were created through the inclusionary development program which um, I know that you're very, very interested in as we are looking at that policy to see if there, we can um, require going forward deeper affordability with that program. But the vast majority of, of projects that we're funding um, are under 60% AMI. Great, and how many units of public housing are we building this year under this budget? I'm looking at Joel, sorry. No, it's fine, please. He, I, I told don't. him to stay close and he didn't, so it's <laughs> his fault. <laughs> My apologies, next time I won't go far. Um, <laughs> um, Councillor, good morning. Um, so I love that question. Um, I think, so I think what makes sense probably to inform the inquiry um, is a couple of things. We can talk about and get more detail on BHA's um, federal capital plan, which probably gets the most in information on that. But what I do also want to talk about um, are a couple of things. One is that one of the things that this budget does on the capital side that was in one slide, as you know, is put huge preservation resources. Mm -hmm. I think that because if we were starting from every unit is new, I would absolutely say that's, that's the first question you should go to. Mm -hmm. I think we're starting with a portfolio that has a billion and a half in capital backlog. And this administration has put forward capital investment in the housing authority that is essentially equivalent to what we got through the entire entire like ARA package, the you know, President Obama era stimulus. So it's for a local government to do that, even with federal resources, is unheard of and incredible. And it helps us to keep the number of units that we have. So um, Joel, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, no I'm on a timer. So it seems like the capital investments to BHA are gonna be focused on basically preservation. Yeah, preservation and catching up to the backlog that we have. So yes. is the number of new units zero? I think that that's probably correct. Okay. We, so I'm going I'm to say two things real quick, um, mm -hmm. uh, timer acknowledged. Uh, <laughs> we likely have units, some, a handful of units offline that we're bringing back online. Whether you want to, you may not call that a new unit, it is creating another housing opportunity Absolutely. that doesn't exist right now. Absolutely. I think the other thing is that, um, and, and credit to the council, could it, and um, Councillor Bach, of course, has brought a lot to us in terms of utilizing our uh, authority under the fair cloth limit. We're very much in a, uh, we're trying to figure out how to, with a limited, um, we're trying to figure out how to bring in the federal resources as much as possible. This includes figuring out how to cost effectively deploy mm -hmm. um, federal subsidy 
So we will be issuing an RFP uh, related to um, that fair cloth authority to try to get at some other strategies. Um, we've look, we looked at one option, didn't pan out. We're gonna look at a couple of other ways to try to do exactly what you just said, which is bring that federal operating subsidy online. Um, so that's, it's a bigger topic, but we're, we are moving with another request for proposals for, I think, kind of consulting services to, to get at that. I look forward to you coming to our hearing. <laughs> um, Chair, how much time do I have? Less than two minutes. Okay, beautiful, thank you so much. Okay, so I am the chair of both the Housing and the Environmental Justice Committee here on the City Council, and there are all the obviously overlapping issues there, so my two next questions are gonna be focused on that. So most of our carbon emissions we know come from buildings and transportation. Uh, what investments are we making in the budget to retrofit public housing buildings to green standards? I'm assuming that <laughs> that is part of the preservation, <laughs> part of the preservation money that Joel just outlined. Sorry, Joel, that you got all the way up there. Um, and my second question is that we are looking at issues of green gentrification in our office and on the housing committee. And um, your office is making an incredible amount of investment in new affordable housing across the city. Are we incentivizing building in climate resilient locations? And are we paying attention to where we are building housing in climate resilient locations in the city? So I will say just a couple of comments on that before I ask Joel about yeah, please. the BHA. But um, all new construction uh, starting at the last RFP uh, we are requiring developers to develop carbon neutral buildings. Um, that's really important. We're also um, being very mindful that they are within walking distance to um, good rapid transit and you know reducing parking, but they do need to be carbon ne neutral if they want to get funding from us. Um, Joel, do you want to comment on the... Joel, do you want to just sit right here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare. Uh, but um, so... And so there, and there's, there's really, there's, there's two aspects to this. I think that there's the, the, I do think the capital investments that were laid out for both Haley and, and for a number of other sites um, will help in this area. They are preservation is noted and specifically, um, I think that that, so the numbers, as you know, the, the numbers on Haley, 52 million, the um, other, other sites, 33. Um, the the elements of that which really are for, I think, emissions reductions are elements that are helping also address indoor air quality issues, things like improving, um, you know, the addressing the ventilation and windows of those properties, I think will also increase uh, efficiency. So we're, you know, really trying to make investments that both help with, um, healthy housing as well as meeting our emissions reductions. I know that the mayor's office is also putting forward, um, and I think I'll have to tip, tip back to either MOH or, or for the subsequent environment hearing um, on that, but I know that there are also efforts to provide some resources for retrofitting buildings separate from any BHA specific investment. Okay. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that we are, the housing authority is, you know, we're an external entity, we're a large landlord, we are subject to, um, to the, the Birdo ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I don't know if everyone is pleased, I'm pleased, I was here to help pass the first one, so I, I'm, I'm thrilled about that, but we are very much focused on thinking about how to reduce emissions there through combinations of investments and really having to align our capital planning as well as any RFPs we put out for you know external partners to be in line with the city the, the city goals and, and requirements. So Thank you, Joe. leave that for there. Yeah. I um I didn't get an answer to the question about incentivizing housing in in climate resilient locations, but I can leave it for the next round, Chair. No, no, you can respond. Okay. I think I don't have an I I, I don't know if part of our review is looking at um, climate resilient locations. You did mention green gentrification, and um, one thing we are proposing, I'll have to get back to you on the, um, on the, the first question. The, the question or the comment around green gentrification, and we're certainly concerned about transportation improvements and associated gentrification, which we've really seen happen in Somerville and Cambridge with the extension of the Green Line. 
Um, we are proposing that the ARPA fund, that some of the ARPA funding, while we love AOP and we want to do it in every corner of the city, we want to take units out of the speculative market, we do want to be very intentional about looking where we, where we really may see an escalation in value because of improvements. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about green gentrification, mm -hmm. but we should actually think about that as well and maybe expand the de definition uh, with the ARPA investments. So I'd, I'd like to work on that and get back to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you so much, Chair. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Madam Chair, and thanks so much to MOH and OFHG for being here. Um, you know I'm huge fans of your work. Um, and BHA as well. Uh, Joel, maybe I'll pull you back down for BHA question, which is just uh, to basically dovetail on uh, Councillor Lara, and I know it's something Councillor louis Jean is also very interested in. I mean, I do want to see us building new public housing, and it seems to me that, you know, there's one way of looking at it that says, yeah, the BHA's got this billion and a half dollar backlog, so how are we ever going to find resources to create new units. There's another way of looking at it that says, we're doing new unit creation. How do we use this federal resource to buy down the affordability, especially given the fact that, uh, you know, we are constantly talking about the fact that so many of our extremely low income Bostonians are not served by the brackets that we're able to kind of pencil out on the affordable housing production side. So I guess, Sheila, I mean, you, this is, it's a question for both you um, and Joel. I mean, it still seems to me that there's a definite opportunity here in places we are doing housing creation to use this, this federal operating money that we're eligible for, especially with the kind of conversion from public housing to RAD, to get new um, units at that affordability level online. So like, would love to hear a bit about that. And maybe, Joel, if you could talk a little bit more about the RFP that we funded in last year's like budget and kind of where the Faircloth conversation is um, at the BHA. Um, I also, just entering a few related questions here, I mean, obviously, when I look at something like the spending by district percentages and see only 1% uh, of the affordable housing funds being spent in District 8, um, it's super frustrating to me. And I, I mean, I know that land is expensive in my district and all that, but it does feel like there's a couple of really big play opportunities for us. I mean, one is obviously the West End Library, and so like I'd love a little bit um, uh, of update on that, but also I know you know one of the things that we've looked at Joel in particular is is some of the you know land that's owned in Mission Hill. Is that a place we could site some some of these new public housing units? Um, and those are both you know really important priorities to me. So maybe I'll stop there for a minute and see if you guys could could say a little bit about uh, our efforts on this front. Thank you, Councillor. So we are. Um, we are working on a couple of fronts, um, and I think the one that I neglected to mention before is um, when answering uh, Councilor Braden's question about Faneuil. I think one of the things that we did differently on that on that particular RFP was invite proposals that actually would help utilize some of this capacity, so that when we're thinking about substantial changes to any site, um, that's one opportunity, uh, and, and we did, so we invited responses there that would uh, include utilizing some of this capacity, so we have additional housing serving extremely low-income persons. I think that the, um, the West End Library is a tremendous opportunity, as you've noted. Um, thank you for being a champion of this. It's something where we are in um, deep discussion with the city on. I think what we're trying to best identify when we when we have flagship projects that are particularly when they're you know when they're owned by a different agency than the BHA, right? We're trying to figure out how best to position that resource so that when uh, to, to, to determine basically how do we how do we get the subs how do we deliver the subsidy and put it out there so it's both enticing if it's something that is optional, if it's something that is required for whomever is actually constructing the units, that we've checked every box on the federal guidelines to make sure that we have um, followed all rules for public competition. That might sound like I'm trying to be really vague and bureaucratic, but what I'm trying to say is that BHA would love to figure out a way to provide uh, subsidy in that project, and I think we are um, working, as you know, we retain outside legal counsel um, for, for some special projects, and this is one of them where we're trying to think through 
um, the flow of subsidy and the way that we can put it out there either immediately in concert with the city in sort of one package or as a separate simultaneous thing that then someone who is a partner on projects like the Weston Library could respond to. Um, so I think that that's, that's where we are. We've been in some fairly recent conversations just to try to find the right path on that. And I think it is on the BHA to come back to the city and give some um, suggestions for what's the appropriate path to proceed. Um, and um, as noted, we're, we're working on um, some of the uh, consulting services under the prior authorization um, presently. Um, I know that, um, so I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, my colleague, Dr. Taylor Kane, is um, um, working on that project directly, doing some great work pushing that forward. Um, I think the reason we have, we have continued to move the conversation on Faircloth. I think what we wanted to do with the city's funds in this is make the best use of it. And so we tried to further tailor that, um, those consulting, the scope of the consulting services before that's um, been issued. So as noted, public housing, uh, part, the sort of partnership projects, the redevelopment project, we've looked there. We are looking at the public-public partnerships like the library, uh, and separately doing some on consulting services. And as you may know, uh, or as you do know, on the, the prior thing that we found that didn't work was just putting out with like a really low operating subsidy. Yeah. Um, so we did, we, we checked off one box in terms of, okay, we know what's not gonna work. We have probably three, um, three or four other options um, that we're looking at now. Um, I, I think that the, the Mission Hill, there are, there's still opportunity the Mission Hill parcels. Some of the parcels we've looked at, um, either you know, conceptually, um, where BHA sites where, where density could be increased, and I think the question there is, do we, are, is everyone then ready to go into that sort of um, neighborhood discussion, planning discussion? And in some cases, I think that that's not clear. The other cases are some of them are, are very much open space that is, are well loved, so I think we wouldn't want to remove open space from a community unless there was some kind of um, clarity that we would be uh, include, net increasing that in some other partnerships. So that's a long answer, but there's probably five or six actually different strands of this and I'm um, trying to keep them all moving. <laughs> Great, um, yeah, I, I guess I would just underscore that I think given the fact that we've got about 2,500 public housing units that we are entitled to in the city that we don't have, that I, I totally take your point about like, you know, we need neighborhood buy-in, et cetera, but I feel like we need to get to the place of like actually having a plan and saying, okay, so with our 40,000 families on the list, like here's how we could add 2,500 more units and here's how we could put them all over the city and have everybody, you know, and the council understand this and be on board and kind of, instead of, I think it's good to pick off a first project or two and I, we've got to be able to get over the legal hurdles on the public-public partnership. Um, and uh, I, I do understand from my past bureaucratic life how complicated that can be, but it's like we've got to figure that out and then we've got to figure it out in a way that we can copy because it may be that not all the sites that we want to do this on, in fact, many of them may not be owned by BHA but owned by another entity um, connected to this building. So I just want to emphasize that I feel like this is the year to do that legwork. I'm already frustrated by the fact that we are not going to probably be able to use much of the ARPA money for execution on this just because of timeline stuff. And so trying to figure out how we move that forward would be great. And for next time when, when the second round, just so OFHE knows, I'm going to ask about the fair housing testing program and kind of what the trajectory of that is. So thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Bach. Council Ferdy, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and obviously thank you to the entire team here from the administration. I know this is a labor of love uh, for all of you, and I appreciate that. I know that my team um, reaches out to you and your staffs uh, regularly, and I appreciate um, your responsiveness, uh, your professionalism, and care and compassion that, um, uh, that you all um, put forth for our residents, and so it's truly appreciated. And I don't have to tell uh, anyone in this room that um, affordable housing is the, the biggest crisis that uh, is facing our city today and that we are at risk of becoming a city of the very, very rich and the very poor. And, and, uh, and so uh, we have a responsibility to stabilize individuals and families uh, who are at risk of displacement. We need to build more affordable housing for individuals and families at a variety of income levels. And to that end, I have a few questions um, 
are we doing anything to advocate for changes in our city's AMI so that we can build at a variety of income levels to better meet the, to better meet the needs of the residents? And um, and when you see projects coming in, again, the very very rich can afford uh, a number of those units, and then we're obviously uh, trying to secure what we can uh, through the city's programming, but. Um, it's the middle, oftentimes, uh, that's also getting left out of the equation, and uh, we need to sort of, again, address all levels of income uh, if we truly want to make uh, our city work for everyone. So to that end, what efforts, uh, and I guess probably Sheila is probably best suited for this, what efforts are underway to sort of address that issue? It's the issue that we all deal with regularly, and there's, there's real tension um, in that, particularly in the, in, in, uh, in the community process. Uh, as it's going through the zoning process and you're going through the community meetings that um, you know folks want uh, housing built at levels that that reflect uh, the needs of the neighborhood and it's a variety it's not sort of a one sort of a, it's not cookie cut uh, mm -hmm. and oftentimes we're being led down the road of being cookie cut and I think we need to have some flexibility in being able to expand those ranges uh, while we're looking out for our, our poorest and most vulnerable residents there's also an entire segment uh, that's being priced out um, within the middle class, but also our seniors and our veterans. So I guess I want to get some thoughts on what efforts are underway with addressing that. There, there is need across most income bands. You're absolutely right. And what the market used to be there for uh, many of our middle income residents, and it no longer is at all, which is tragic. Um, just a few thoughts. So uh, the previous conversation, there are many low-income families and, in, and seniors, and we need to figure out better ways to uh, building housing and preserving housing, but building housing for really the most vulnerable among us. Um, and AMIs, uh, we're just looking at this in our office, AMIs, uh, the, the, the rent levels that we get from HUD, have gone up again, not only AMIs, the area median income, but the Boston median income is going up too. So we, we really do need to get very intentional about new tools and how we serve the, the, the most vulnerable. We are very focused, and I think, on uh, how do we increase the home ownership rates in this city, um, and that is serving a more, more middle income population. So building a lot more housing that our families can purchase um, not seniors to probably don't want to purchase, but our, that our families can purchase. And those do um, have uh, higher income bands associated with those developments. So I think you know, new rental housing for, the, for, for the, the lowest income among us, more, a lot more um, uh, home ownership projects for, for, our, for our middle income families and residents. And I think with the senior buildings, there are some seniors, the vast majority are on fixed income, Social Security, they're very low income. There are seniors that are still, can't afford the market, are being pushed out of properties that they have rented for decades. We're seeing this in every single neighborhood, and it makes my blood boil, that when buildings change hands, seniors that have lived in these apartments for decades are being asked to leave by the new owner. And so we do need, we do need units for that population. And so most of our, most of the new rental buildings for seniors have a range of incomes. We need, uh, we need, you know, those units to serve very low income populations, but some of them are more tax credits. And those are, you know, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars $1,700, which feels really high to me, uh, but, uh, but a senior, middle income senior could afford. So I think um, being intentional about creating housing for very low income populations, being been creating a lot more home ownership housing for middle income families and then with our senior buildings having a range of incomes available and and finally I am looking forward to new leadership at the BPDA I really do believe we've got to start asking our development community and I know there's high development costs but how is the market also responding to the needs of our neighborhoods and communities. Because you know, there's always going to be a finite amount of resource that we have. So when developers come into our neighborhoods and want to develop, what can they do with those developments to serve people that need housing in those neighborhoods? And I just want to keep saying it, but um, because I think those are the questions we need to ask. 
and let us know what we can do to be helpful. Thank Sheila, you. In that regard. One of my favorite programs, I've talked to you a lot about this, is the uh, One Plus Boston Mortgage Program. Yes. It's, uh, I wish we did more of it, frankly, but uh, how much was budgeted for the One Plus Boston Mortgage Program and yeah. versus how much was spent? I'm just going to do a quick rapid fire. How many lenders are currently serving this loan program? How many of the uh, stash program participants have been able to buy a home? And in the Office of Housing Stability, uh, exploring ways to support landlords. What are we doing there? There are a lot of landlords in our city that are renting below market rent. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing the right thing uh, for their communities and for folks in their neighborhoods. However, a lot of them um, are now feeling the crunch of the rising property tax as well as cost of maintenance and repair. If we lose sort of um, that landlord, that type of landlord, and there are a lot of them out there, if we lose that, then that's going to exacerbate our affordable housing problem. What, if anything, can we do on that front uh, to help landlords uh, and incentivize landlords who are, uh, who are renting below market rate? So a couple, of, a couple of things. I know that there are approximately 270, 280 stash participants uh, right now that we are funding. No, there's more participants in that, but, but we are but that we are actively working with. I want to get the, I have to get back to you on the number of those participants that have actually bought. So I don't have those at my fingertips. Um, there is between six and seven. Uh, one plus Boston banks participating. We did just lose Sovereign Bank, which was our largest participant. They're getting out of the mortgage business, which made us all, you know, unhappy. Um, but um, so, but but let me. I'll get you that list as well. Landlords that are. We did try to file legislation, and think in the last session, perhaps, uh, that would allow a tax benefit to landlords that are renting. Uh, properties below the fair market rent. And I believe these, these landlords are doing the right thing and they should get some, some relief. It didn't advance. Um, and, but that, it seems like that's where the natural sort of, like, we can't write them a check, um, but it seems like if they were able to get tax relief, mm -hmm. property tax relief or uh, income tax relief for doing the right thing, I, I thought that was a very, very, very uh, sane um, same piece of legislation, and I think we should look to file it again. Um, yeah. And just lastly, your idea on the master plan for college universities, I couldn't agree more. I will give you just my opinion and experience is that unless our colleges and universities, we can require them to, to, um, to build as much housing on campus for their students. They could actually even have more housing um, than students, but unless that housing is going to be affordable, I live through it. I've got four of them going through college. Uh, they will seek out every possible opportunity to find a cheaper unit to have a little extra dough for whatever it is, whether it's pizza and beer money or it's go to the movies or go to, a, uh, to go to a sporting event. So unless that housing, and that's maybe through our pilot leverage, requiring colleges and universities to put more of their student housing on campus, that's a great concept, but unless it's affordable, these kids naturally, like everyone else would do, they will search for a more affordable unit. More often than not, it's in the neighborhood, which exacerbates the crunch. So it needs to be a double edge. It needs to be, not only do we want you to build more on campus, we want you to make it affordable for your students. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry. Thank you. Councilor, do you want, uh, I can, oh. res oh, Councilor, I, I can respond um, to the Councilor's other questions around the first gen, first generation home buyer max savings program, if that's okay? Okay. Okay. Um, Council, you asked about the funding for the One Plus Boston program. So there's a million dollars of city funding uh, in the annual budget, just like there was last year for the One Plus Boston program. That's on top of our normal kind of down payment assistance program. So all in, it's $3.65 million for both of those um, pots of money. We also um, have gotten CPA funding uh, in 2020 and 2021, $9 million that we're continuing to spend, spend down. Um, on the first generation program, uh, I got an update, I think just yesterday or the day before, that 37 individuals have already purchased um, through the, through awesome. the staff in the first gen program. So that's awesome. really Very good. successful. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you um, to the panelists. I just have a few questions. Um, just curious. Um, we know that there are thousands of city employees who are really struggling to stay here in the city of Boston and with the Boston Jobs Residency, that's one of the requirements. Um, and we've heard from folks who are um, working on the front lines, really trying to um, maintain. Some have to 
take on a second job just to be able to, to stay here in the city of Boston. So I'm just curious if you could just talk to us a little bit about um, what are we doing as a city to provide more housing opportunity for city employees here in Boston? So that's one question. I can, um, I'll just read my questions and then, yeah. Um, then I'm sure you all read the, um, the article in the Boston Globe recently that so many of our people are being priced out of the city of Boston. This is nothing new. We, we know um, if you see the migration trends, um, Brockton, um, Randolph, Stoughton, you know, are taking our, our brightest. And oftentimes these folks have to still commute here to work in the city of Boston. And that commute um, and, uh, you know, that is also a financial burden for a lot of these families who have been displaced um, due to our inability to keep them here. So I'm just curious, how as a city are we working to build a new space um, that reflects the investment that we keep talking about in terms of equity, in terms of diversity, so our black and brown folks can actually stay in the city that they've worked so hard to build? Um, we're seeing a great deal of new lab space popping up all over the city of Boston, everywhere you go. Um, you know, from Alston to Charlestown, um, Roxbury, Mattapan. But I'm just curious, in this particular instance that I'm gonna reference here, there's a development in Brighton. The developers are building a bunch of new lab space, but are not building any new housing. Um, and the influx of workers into that area are really going to impact and displace families. And I'm sure, you know, Councilor Breeden is always talking about this. So I'm just curious, um, you know, what are we doing as a city to, to make sure that we're not, with good intentions, uh, continuing to displace people? Um, just talk to me a little bit about that. And I'm curious about how are we um, looking um, last year, we fought for a new line item in the budget for, jo uh, for jobs for 19 to 24-year-olds. These are young people who are aging out of foster care, young people who are um, transitioning out of DYS, um, young people who are still undecided in terms of what, th how they're going to be able to make their ends meet here in the city of Boston. So I'm just curious, what are we doing um, to support um, workforce development housing through our taxpayer dollars to support um, housing initiatives for, for young people who are 19 to 24 year olds. Um, and then in the rental relief, you know, I'm happy to see that the majority of those dollars went to Dorchester, Roxbury, um, and East Boston. However, I am concerned uh, about not seeing figures for Mission Hill, um, which as we know has one of the highest proportions of renters. Um, in the city of Boston. So I guess this question is specifically how much of the rental relief was spent there. And I know we put Austin and Brighton together, but Austin um, has a much higher proportion of renters than Brighton. So I'm hoping to see the figures for Austin specifically. Um, and then this is less of a question and more just of, as, as, as an opportunity for dialogue, is that we know that the cost of rent is a major burden for people across the city and the rental relief funds help with that. But often that money is going um, to the city's to the city's renters and then into the pockets of landlords, um, and so it feels that sometimes the rental relief is helping the landlords above all. But I'm just curious, um, you know, what are we doing um, to have a holistic view around rental relief that really looks at helping renters, right? Um, how is for example, how is housing working with the Office of Food Access, um, working with the Boston Public Health Commission and their mental health and, and wellness team, or working with workforce development um, and economic empowerment. So I just would love to think about rental relief as a holistic and as, as, as something that is not just about helping to support our landlords, but also looking at the whole renter, if you will. That's a lot, so take it like you would an elephant, eating okay. it one piece at a time. I'm gonna start and then I'm gonna hand it over to Danielle to talk uh, about some of the um, rental relief funding programs. So I read the Globe story too and it was, uh, it was a hard day because of that story. Um, the idea that families, you know, I, I said to anyone who would listen, if families are leaving and it's choice and it's where they wanna be, great. If they want to stay in Boston and they're being displaced, that is not okay. 
So um, there's a big focus in this budget, uh, a big focus in our activities, and certainly we'll be talking more to you more about the ARPA funding for uh, increased support for, for people that want to buy a home in Boston, larger down payments, one plus Boston on steroids, and a lot more product that's affordable. Um, we need to build more affordable homes for families that want to stay. We have been doing that steady. We need to increase that. So, um, so uh, we made an announcement a couple of weeks ago of over $100 million being made available through ARPA and other resources to support home ownership in Boston. So um, more to come on that, but I, I, feel, I feel the need to, I mean, there's a lot of people that want to buy, they want to stay, it's the right thing to do, it builds equity, so we really need to double down on, on those efforts. Lab space. You're right, there is a lot of lab space being developed. Now, uh, we are looking at the linkage policy that would extract additional resources from developers. Um, uh, under certain conditions, and we're looking at lab space uh, individually. We're also doing that analysis to see if we can extract more linkage for affordable housing. Um, but I do want to commend many members on the council that are asking developers that are come forward, coming forward with lab space to also look at housing needs. So thank you to everyone. I know who you are. Thank you for doing that. Um, we have uh, asked the BPDA and um, MAPC, I mentioned it earlier, we're updating our uh, population projections and how that relates to housing and do we have enough housing and what, what type of housing. And part of that analysis is looking at the increase in labs and what is that doing to our housing market. Um, so do we need to build more housing, build more affordable housing because of the increase in lab space? Um, finally, and I don't think this answers your question completely, Councillor, but let me just state. So we are three years into our um, our plan to end youth homelessness, and um, that is uh, youth between the ages, I want to say 18 to 24, and um, homeless, uh, homelessness in that age group, because of great work of staff and, and the BHA and many of us, uh, is down by 45%, I want to say, Lila, which is great. Um, we really have made great strides in housing our homeless young adults, which so, is terrific. Yeah, so could, well, there's, I just want to follow that thread really quick in regards to young people. I also know, because my mom had Section 8, and you know there are lots of things that we can also do to help alleviate um, some of the, the, the way the, the protocols and procedures are, are set. There are young people who need, who could stay with their families, but um, because of the, you know, the federal regulations now have to leave their homes um, because if not, that's going to impact their, their family's income ratio. And so oftentimes they're, they are pushed out of those um, there's that safety net. And so I'm just curious if you could just talk a little bit about um, what can we do as a city to help support some of the students who are who have vouchers, but because now they're older. Damn. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Um, okay, we're good. Yep, I'll, I'll briefly speak, Councilor Mejia, regarding the rental relief fund. Um, I am glad that you asked the question regarding the holistic approach. That's something that I think is very important when doing this work. Uh, the rental relief fund also provides cash to tenants, which is uh, 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 something that we utilize quite often because, frankly, there are landlords that won't accept um, the, the money. Um, but in terms of holistic approach, that's something that we're considering. Um, I think it's important, you know, when you get a tenant that comes in and says they don't have any source of income, whether it's Social Security income or food stamps, you know, you want to ask why. Uh, and also, not only, um, and, and aside from that, not helping tenants navigate poverty, but moving away from that. So that's something that our office is really trying to do in, in terms of issue spotting and listening to the, and asking the correct questions. So thank you for that question and happy to have a, a continuous di dialogue with you on that. Do you have another one? Yes. For, Good. yeah. One more question. Oh. We got more time? Yeah, everyone is asking another question. Oh, wow. It's a bonus round. Thank you, Chair. I didn't know that. OK. You get some points for that. Um, so so I, I do want to just 
kind of hear Sheila, and I know Kate is not here, but there was a very specific example that brought this question up around students who, um, because of their college credits, that changes the, the dynamics. Um, and oftentimes these kids can stay at home if we could change the policy for them to be able to still be under that lease. So can, I, I don't know if anybody's here from BHA. Joel is. Joel, you were, this was probably before your time, um, but if you could speak to um, this whole notion that once you, you, know, you go to college, that changes the family structure and then also your credits and the financial uh, hardships. Um, thank you, Counselor. Um, I think so. I, I, f I think the basic thrust of the matter is, as you noted, under the federal so federal public housing and federal Section Eight uh, or federal voucher programs, um, we're required. You know, housing authorities required, or, or anyone who administers administers Section Eight would be required to count the household income. And there are very uh, specifically defined income exclusions and income deductions. And one of the things about um, a lot of BHA households is a lot of folks who are students, um, when they first go to school, they might be in, um, or sorry, when they're going into sort of higher ed, they may be community college students, they may be working a some and in school some, and often don't qualify there. I think you hit on the thrust of it, which is that, uh, the, the crux of it, excuse me, which is, which is that the federal government right now doesn't give us flexibility there. Um, we have been trying to get a little bit more flexibility in some of our regulatory authorities that has not proved successful thus far. But what I can say is, is basically the exclusion, the way we're able to exclude income, I believe, is for full-time students, not part-time. And I think that is typically where this issue comes up because it doesn't match with the population we actually serve. Um, um, certainly on Section 8, but I think even sometimes even more so, I think, on the public housing side. That yeah. makes it very difficult. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, and I do appreciate the chair giving us a little bit of grace and some extra time. And I just would like to underscore that while the rental relief is a, a big part of the work and support, you know, our office, and, and you know this, Sheila, because we've worked in deep collaboration with you and Kate and so many other folks, that we've had to tap into our own resources and networks to set people up for emergency housing, whether it be fleeting domestic violence situations, um, just folks who are waiting on the waiting list for a BHA or, or anything like that. And sometimes our elders, who are probably a month away from being qualified to be able to... Um, have access to housing, we've put them up literally in hotels, Airbnbs, like we have found so many ways to be creative to support our constituents. And on the housing front, I just do think that there needs to be more funding put into supporting people who need immediate um, housing uh, support. That's all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Mahir. Uh, all right, where are my notes? So I just, you know, I just want to preface my questions and um, our conversation with, uh, first of all, I don't envy you. Like, this is an extremely hard task. Um, and Sheila, uh, Chief Dillon, um, as graceful as you make it seem, as easy as you make it seem, it's, I'm sure it's, um, it's arduous and it's a lot. And I, you're charged with one of the biggest things that people campaign on. Oh, my God. Um, with that being said, I, I heard Council Bach's point in terms of like creating affordable housing in Fenway, for example, yeah. or Back Bay. And there are a lot of like opportunities with buildings that are either empty or abandoned or I don't know, for whatever reason, loss of business. Yeah. And so there are some opportunities there of exploring affordable housing and desegregating Boston. So I guess for me personally, like in terms of building affordable units or especially rental in densely populated areas like Roxbury um, is a problem because we are looking at, you know, a people that advocate for housing and because they are low income and because they are about 75% renters in Roxbury, they are highly concerned about, you know, not being pushed out, right? They don't want to be displaced. They are advocates and they are um, very passionate about this issue. This 
I think, you know, can lead people to feel exploited when they are presented with not opportunities for development. Because then they say, of course, you know, you pull on your, our heartstrings and of course we're gonna say yes to affordable housing. We deeply understand this issue. However, it is not the responsibility for the poor people in Roxbury to house the unhoused, to take on Boston's burden. We should spread that out, and I know you agree. And so I would highly um, encourage your office to include the council in any type of engagement in how we can look at opportunities such as the one that Council Bach mentioned. Because I think we should spread it out. I don't think that we should continue to build affordable rental in Roxbury further um, <clears throat> impoverishing those communities. I think that we should increase and in mix income in Roxbury, but to a degree. And then to the point of not taking, and I think I heard um, Joel say this, not taking away green spaces or an increasing in quality living um, opportunities. This means the holistic, that ecosystem, right? Um, making sure that our business districts are thriving. And to do that, we, all the efforts that you are putting on the table, right? So activating land spaces and revitalizing our districts, our business districts. And to, so our, our lot in Roxbury, I think, as a district counselor, I think looks like opportunities for, to increase quality of life. Whereas we get a lot, we're getting a lot of housing. So I know that you have some plans, um, and I I thank you for um, lending me your uh, one of your best. I've worked with Donald before in activating spaces mm -hmm. in my previous job, and I look forward to more. Great. So I say that to just say, look, I my questions are not going to be obviously um, to hold anyone accountable. We we are in this together and we should assume the responsibility together. Um, so for me, how many these restricted, and I saw that in, there's a line item or page 148 of the budget, um, the number of new units is categorized by deed restricted and IDP low income mm -hmm. units and deed restricted and market middle income yeah. units. Then there's, and I feel like this continues a uh, sort of a, uh, portrays this sort of market units um, market rate units of affordable and middle income. And so the concern is like how, what is the, what is the AMI for if there are these restricted units, how many of those are gonna be um, done for next year or the following and what are the AMIs? I think the biggest thing is, yes, we want lower AMIs. We want them in affluent communities, right? <laughs> we want to spread it out and then we want um, opportunities for quality of life in Roxbury. So how many deed restricted units have you built in the past three years and what yeah. is the goal for the next year? So just a, a comment before, before I try to answer some of those very important questions. So I am in agreement, we are in agreement that affordable housing needs to be throughout the city, absolutely. Um, the citywide average of affordable housing is 19.2% of our overall housing stock is affordable. 54% of housing stock in Roxbury is affordable. Um, uh, Chinatown's 50%, uh, the South End is 33%, Back Bay, 6%, Beacon Hill, 6%, right? So, um, so right now, in every one of our funding rounds, we're prioritizing projects that have less than the citywide average really trying to say to uh, developers of affordable housing, we're interested in seeing projects come from throughout the city, but more importantly, project uh, neighborhoods that have uh, the need for affordable housing and that are well below the citywide average. So I totally, totally agree with you. Um, this is, it's important for, because those communities need affordable housing and um, it's, it, Yes, just important for so many reasons. Um, so last year, and I'm looking at, um, I think I had in front of me, last year we had, the, we, had we built uh, 1,400 units. Um, they were spread out more throughout the city. Um, they, you know, 
Jamaica Plain had 20%, Roxbury had 16% of the units. So it, they were spread more spread out, and I think that is in part because we are really asking other areas to to bring us projects where you know of affordable housing, and we are looking for um, we're looking for private development too in areas that have just seen a lot of affordable housing. Um, our, I think our challenge, Councilor Knight, and I would welcome your thinking on this. You know, we looked at Nubian and all the land that was in Nubian. We went and we said, okay, what should we do? And a lot of residents felt the Senhai model that was, even before my time, if that's possible, but it was a third, a third low income, a third middle income, and a third market, really felt good to folks. And so that's, we use that model in Nubian and in some of the, I think it's also being used on parcel three. So I, I think that's an interesting approach and one the community felt really good about. They recognize that they need market rate housing for people that want to return to Roxbury or stay in Roxbury and that have inco higher incomes, but they also wanted resources available for families that may be displaced or, or seniors that may be displaced. So that is one strategy that I think made sense and one that we adopted with the community and, and, um, and so far is working. So um, you, you did ask uh, what- 1,400 units right. of that, what were uh, deed restricted and then- Yeah, so of the 1,400 units that we've been talking about uh, that were deed restricted, that were sorry, that were permitted last year and began construction, all of those had a deed restriction on them, all of them. Thank you. And what do you, do we know what the MIs were? Um, so 32% uh, were below 30% of AMI, 25% were between 30 and 60% AMI, there was another 30%, 30 per, about in 32% that were between 60 and 80% AMI. The majority of those are inclusionary development units, and then a smattering above that. Um, so there was, you know, we do hear the need for very low income, so about 32% were very low income, and about a third of was more middle income. So, What's yeah. the goal for the next year? Again, sorry, I know yeah, you Yeah, no, it. and it's, it's a great question. We don't have a specific goal on where we have various funding sources that have to be used in certain ways. Um, we, do, we don't, though, have a set goal of how much in this band, how much in this band, and how much in this band. Um, we are certainly looking at the applications when they come in, and we're, we're making sure that uh, the new housing that's being created will serve a wide range of households, but we don't go into the fiscal year with specific goals. Maybe we should, um, but we don't have those stated right now. Thank you. The community, um, that does away with my next three questions, but I will uh, move on to something else. Um, the community really feels, as in particularly D7, um, including South End, really feels overwhelmed with the process, the RFP par processes and all the meetings, right? Mm. Meetings and meetings, and they can't catch up to all of them. Um, between RFPs and ZBA hearings and BPDA uh, permits or licensing, they cannot catch up. And so there's a real demand or request from the community to s slow down certain processes and allow them to uh, be able to attend all of the meetings that affects them, in particularly Roxbury. Um, are there any efforts to try to accommodate? That is a really very, very valid point because not only are we pushing, we don't want to own land, we want to get it into development, we, we want to see great development happen, we're aware that people want to buy homes and need affordable housing, so we're pushing. In fact, my, I would say my staff isn't pushing hard enough, and I'm always sort of saying, okay, go, go, go. So, um, but, there, but communities are also responding to a lot of market rate development and all of the IAGs associated with that and the, the community meetings associated with that. So I can see where the BPDA is probably scheduling meetings, we're scheduling meetings, and people are like, there's four meetings this week. Um, and I think Zoom's helping a little bit because people are more comfortable sometimes in their homes, but it must be overwhelming. We are not, I'll come clean, we are not sitting down with the BPDA or the ZBA saying, okay, what is, what, what's happening in D7 and what does the community calendar look like uh, in July? We should. We absolutely should. 
Um, so I'd be glad to follow up on that. It's, it's, I think it's a very, very valid, good idea. We shouldn't be overwhelming communities because we want their participation. I think I'll just say for myself, I feel a lot of pressure to get things done. So I am often trying to push anything and everybody to, to move forward on, on good projects. So I'm probably guilty of some of that, um, but I think we do need better coordination at a city level. Thank you for your transparency and honesty. Um, that leads me to your, to your top 10 salary earners, right? Um, what, what can we do about that? So it's, um, we have worked really hard to diversify senior leadership, not just at a deputy director level, but all, all levels of management at the Mayor's Office of Housing, and bring in new staff that are, um, that are, are we want them to learn affordable housing, we want them to learn to finance, we want them to learn you know, uh, what we can do to help our residents and, and, and promote them. There's a lot of internal promotions. So there's a lot of effort. Um, we're very, very pleased that we've been able to bring in Danielle and, and others of, uh, she's just so talented in senior leadership. What you're seeing on the, on the salary, and, I'm, and I, I can hand it over to Rick as well, that we have long-term uh, um, employees that um, are not deputy directors managing units, but have been there for very long periods of time, so they have higher pay than even some of the deputies. So I think you're seeing that reflected, but let me see if Rick wants to add to that. Yeah, I, I can point to some of the things that Donald mentioned earlier in his part of the presentation that we've done in the past two years to try to recruit and, att and attract um, people of color into our, our, all of our positions, but especially our leadership positions. I know I've been part of hiring processes where we've really expanded outreach. I mean, we have a spreadsheet of you know, 30 organizations that we're reaching out to with our job postings um, for different organ organizations and job posting sites. Um, I think it was um, uh, the other counselor uh, uh, asked about kind of uh, language access as well. So we are, for, particularly for constituent facing positions, pr providing a preference for um, candidates who speak multiple languages because we think that's important as well, like in the Office of Housing Stability in the Boston Home Center. But particularly in the leadership, um, I, I don't think we've ever done this level of outreach before, not just posting jobs on LinkedIn, um, which is the, kind of the city's normal practice, but going, going well beyond that. Um, we did recently hire, um, Sheila mentioned Danielle, there were three, we're, we're, no, we're happy that three women of color recently were hired or promoted into management positions in the department, and we hope to have many more. Thank you, that's my time. Um, I do, do, do we have people signed on for Testify? Virtual or in person? In person, right there. I recognize it. George. Please join us. <laughs> Who doesn't know George? Um, is it afternoon? Uh, good afternoon, George. How are you? Good, nice thank to see you, you again. Good to and see you. thank you so much for all of your advocacy, your emails, um, and support. I we love having you here. So um, since you're the only one in person, we'll allow you a good three to four minutes to testify. Good afternoon. Thank you for chairing this hearing. Thank you for um, all the staff here who've been giving information and all the city councilors who've been asking good questions. Um, as you can see, I'm here alone. Um, unfortunately, this is during school time, so a number of young people really care about affordable housing. Folks will be back on June 2nd during the general hearing, but weren't able to come here today to testify. And I think um, in general, obviously, like thousands of people across the city really care about housing, so it's unfortunate that there's not a this setting isn't a great way to engage folks. So I wonder if there's other ways to, especially as we're moving toward participatory budgeting, if there's ways to do some more community events to really get a lot more impact um, input on, on this issue. Um, and the, the budget, uh, it's great that Mayor Wu is adding a lot of federal money for housing, but it's really important that we step up the city portion of that. It looks like in the mayor's office of housing, um, the budget's a little hard to understand. Um, but the D Department of 
housing development and services, I think, like 36 million. It, it seems like that's kind of the chunk of where city money is for the low-income rental subsidies and affordable housing construction. Um, that needs to be boosted up by a lot more. But I think to give meaningful input on that, we really need more information about how that money, not just the, the lump sum of all the federal money and all the IDP money, but how is the city money being spent and how can we increase that? Um, how many units are being constructed with city money? What AMIs? How much from AOP with city money is, is, is being, how many units are being bought and protected for all the folks facing displacement? The question is about public housing in terms of how, how, much, um, how many units there are, how many are in disrepair, what's the plan to repair them? Is that in the operating budget, the capital budget? Um, so, um, and, and more information on the low income rental subsidies. How many people can actually afford these 60 and 70% AMI units, especially with the AMIs going up? Um, we heard from a lot of CDCs who manage affordable housing waiting lists that, or who are trying to get people into affordable housing, that a lot of applicants, their applications are basically being thrown out when they apply for these 60 and 70 AMI units because they don't have vouchers and they can't afford them because they don't make that much. Um, so we need um, kind of information, more detailed information on, on how the budget works, especially you know, looking to y'all city councilors as you're debating amendments to this year's budget. It's great that y'all are asking all these questions about all the different programs, but at the end of the day, one of your key responsibilities is gonna be to say, we want X million in the budget for housing. And to make that decision, y'all need that information on, on what millions are there already and what they're being used. And then to match that up with community need. Who's cost burdened? Who's being displaced? What are the patterns based on race, gender, all the demographic information? Um, waiting lists for public housing, affordable housing. How much is getting constructed now? And it doesn't really meet the need. Um, one thing that feels really odd about the, uh, the performance goals or measures is, is it talks about market rate, middle income affordable housing, which is indeed restricted. And um, I, I, I mean, it's, there's just not information about that. I'm a little skeptical. Is, is it like a 3,000 apartment, dollar apartment market rate affordable? So just really getting more information in the budget so we can make decisions. Um, so that's kind of the basic. I'm, I'm not really here today to like name a number except way, way more than, than 36 million. Um, hopefully by June 2nd, we'll get more information from the city so that y'all on city council can say, we really need this much more money and so the community can give input on that. Um, the two other things I just wanna shout out, some folks know that a delegation from Dorchester Not For Sale went to the mayor's office today to deliver about 700 petition signatures to slow down Dorchester Bay City. This goes to the points about um, you know, the, the process you were just talking about, Councillor Anderson and all the development just running through the city, but that's a, a major development that's unaffordable. And then also folks are asking for a $5 million community land trust fund, which stewards all types of housing, whether it's ownership, rental, condos, co-ops, rent to own, commercial farms, open space, as well as $50 million from ARPA for the acquisition opportunity program so that we can really get 1,000 units off the speculative market, not by 2030, but by 2026. So I'm sure there'll be more recommendations to come when we get more info, but those are some that are out there now. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Um, I have your questions, um, and I'll send them to uh, the panelists, House Management Administration, and then uh, once I have the answers, I can email you back. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have um, Renee and Hillary ready on virtual? Hi, Renee. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Uh, Excellent. You, Thank you so much. You're very um, welcome. You have uh, two minutes to testify. Perfect. So my name is Renee Mardones. I'm here testifying on behalf of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative and the Great Boston Community Land Trust Network. As you know, the people of color in Boston face the highest rate of eviction and displacement. We're losing existing housing because investors see an opportunity to make money at the expense of low-income families. Removing land and housing from the market and make them affordable in perpetuity is a critical and overlooked strategy. I'm here today to ask you to allocate $5 million to community land trust 
that continues has a constant stream of funding year after year and a match of five million to the ARPA funding. Um, an increase of the to the acquisition opportunity program, as we heard today, is, is a, a key strategy that the city is using. Um, uh, and um, five million to ARPA money that can um, be ready for the next round. Also, as we heard, um, uh, the 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 cap for the acquisition opportunity program. It doesn't allow for us, like community land trusts, to compete um, with, you know, like uh, private investors. So we are asking to increase the the cap to two hundred thousand uh, uh, dollar per unit. Um, we hope you can support these strategies uh, for acquisition and preservation of affordable units, and we need to stop displacement and to keep people health and healthy and safe homes now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renee Mardones. Uh, next, we have Ms. Hillary Pizer, or is it Pfizer? <laughs> Hi, Hillary. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Welcome, and thank you for. Uh, showing up. We'd love to hear your testimony. All right, you thank you very two, much. You have two minutes. Thank you. Great. Um, I want to thank all of you for asking great questions. And um, I'm representing MAHA today, the Mass Affordable Housing Alliance. And I just wanted to say we're really excited about the $106 million that the mayor has allocated for homeownership. And um, we want to thank the council also for being very committed to that $100 million. Um, everybody may know that, you know, over the years, uh, what comes online is usually over 90% rental, um, including the units for people between 50% 50, 50 of AMI and 80% of AMI. So I think it's, it's great that there's so much emphasis now around making the the rental units um, available over a broader range at lower incomes, um, and also looking at some of the the developments that are now rental that could be ownership. Understood it's really complicated because the city has much more in the way of partnerships with state and federal funders on the rental side, uh, but just wanted to thank everybody for making a real commitment to home ownership. And, you know, our our members, Maha has graduated over 5,000 home buyers in the last couple of years, um, and they're having to all leave the city. And I think not all of them, many of them are having to leave the city. And to me, as an organizer, I've been with Maha over 34 years now. Um, it's breaking my heart to see the community being busted up and just dispersing. Um, now, some of those people want to move, and that is great but so many of them, um, if there's a way to stay in the city, they wanna do that, but they also want a piece of that American dream. They want that security. They wanna leave their kids in a better state than they started out in. And um, so making a way for them to do that in Boston, and we wanna work with both the council and um, Chief Dillon and the administration to make sure that we turbocharge our um, ownership units, both through development um, I, I would like to understand better um, the possibilities and limitations of a, a similar program to AOP, but for ownership, um, where we can take ownership units and, and perhaps put them back into use as extended family housing, like they used to be before the investors um, took over, um, to really keep some of our, our hardworking, really talented people in the city. Um, so that's really all I have to say. I'll submit some written comments that are a little more detailed. Uh, I don't want to keep anybody longer than we've already been here. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Hillary. All right. Round two. Should have the Street Fighter. No. <laughs> uh, Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let's see where we are. 
you know, one of the conversations we have with the BPDA folks as they look at our district um, in Alston Brighton is are looking at, at um, the Western Ave corridor study, for example. They talk about the highest and best use, and that usually, uh, the land use that, that will generate, that usually equates with the land use that will generate the most income. And right now, that is labs. And we are being asked to um, use our limited land resources to build labs. Um, and when you say to developers that come in with a lab project, uh, we need you to build housing, generally, most of the time, they say, we don't do housing. Yet, you know, we're being asked, right now, the projects that are under review are generating like 6,000 parking spots. So the, the assumption is not only will they build on our limited amount of land, but they'll also expect that their workforce is going to be driving in from the suburbs. And that's not sustainable. So in Alston and Brighton, we, um, you know, one of our, I, I'll raise it up the flagpole. I'm just going to put this on the record that Harvard owns one third of Alston and is poised to develop about 165 acres of under our undeveloped land right now. In the midst of our housing crisis, the, the residents of Alston Brighton want to work with the city and Harvard to create a vision and a plan for a more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable neighborhood. Um, I think, and that would include mixed income housing and ownership and rental opportunities. Um, the, the initial projects that have come out of the gate um, are wonderful projects, but they do not address our concerns about affordability. And um, it's, it's um, I think we've got this huge opportunity, and that if we fail to work with Harvard, and Harvard fails to work with us, um, we'll have missed a huge opportunity to really develop a sustainable, equitable, and uh, resilient neighborhood that has somewhere for everyone. Um, the, the metric that, you know, the whole idea that your highest and best use is lab development or something that's going to generate a lot of money takes away the human perspective of we have, we have food deserts in Alston Brighton. We have um, a high, high, the lowest, the second, the lowest uh, home ownership in the city, I think, along with, with Mission Hill. And that, that, that statistic is a direct result of speculative investment uh, in a neighborhood that is adjoined to universities and, and medical, um, medical facilities that where uh, investors can, can guarantee good, good return on their investment uh, by buying up our family homes. So I don't know what the answer is. I think I, I'm challenging Harvard to come to the table and work with the city to uh, see what we can do. They could do something truly amazing if they work with us. And um, I'm hoping that we will get there. But um, it's, uh, it is going to be a process. And I, I really hope that we will, we will see the fruits of this effort going forward. Um, again, that's more of a statement than a question. I think we just have to keep pushing. And um, the, one, the, one, the other question I had was really in terms of your population projections and your your data analysis are you do you have your own your own department in 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 the housing to do that work or do you depend on bpda so we have uh, a, a handful of very very talented researchers at moh but because population uh, projections are really complicated and you and you do want to get it right we work very closely with the bpda and um, metropolitan planning uh, Council. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, we, we work with Absolutely. both of yeah. those uh, just um, to, to really uh, make sure our projections are as, as good as they can be. So it's a collaborative effort. Yeah. One, one big challenge we have, like, and we're, we're actually working with the Donahue Institute at UMass to try and see what can be done to correct the, the count. But it seems like Alston is Brighton. Alston Brighton is probably a 50, 55,000 under count. And, and when we talk to the city demographer at BPDA, they, he's suggesting that there's a significant undercount of populations where English is not their first language and immigrant populations. So uh, 
I think the the challenges of relying on the the, set, the last census is, are are pretty pretty significant. Um, okay, I think that's uh, it's been a long morning, and I think I'll I'll yield my time to my fellow colleagues. Better, Thank uh, you, Madam Chair. Save the energy for our next hearing, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Um, Councilor Lu Jen, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thanks everyone for sticking through all these questions. Um, first question is for uh, Director Onuoha uh, regarding uh, discrimination in lending and appraisals. Um, we're talking about, you know, there's that article that talked about how everyone's moving out, who wants to be able to buy a home, our black and brown families. They also talked about the discriminatory practices, particularly in lending, right? Um, but we also know that it exists in appraisals and in almost every stage in the home buying process. So I was wondering what your office um, has been doing to respond to that, or what you can do to respond to that. Thank you, Councillor <clears throat> Louis Jen. Uh, it's interesting you asked that question because that is one of the things that we've been actually meeting about. As you know, um, we are the implement, we are the ones who are implementing Mayor Wu's um, AFH, which is her firmly, <laughs> firmly further and fair housing um, executive order. And in doing that, one of the things that we, of the 108 goals that were assigned to us, or our departments, even though there's 108 assigned throughout the entire city to various departments, is looking at um, appraisals. We are in the process of actually exploring who we're going to use to do that kind of testing for us. Suffolk doesn't specifically do that kind of testing, but there are a number of agencies that we've actually been in, um, looking up to do that kind of testing, to do appraisal testing for this for that same exact reason, and also ones who are looking at using to do testing with banks, you know, um, because we do know that redlining happens, or it's just a little bit more um, covert, if you will. But to answer your question, this is something that we will be doing in FY23, and we will have those numbers and those um, the outcomes of that to actually speak to the council on that. Great, thank you. Um, and you know, if there's any information on work we've done in the past in this space, I'd, I'd be curious to, okay. we haven't done anything. I, I know that it's mostly, you know, it's treated as a federal issue mm -hmm. and, and combated, mm -hmm. but I think that there's work for us to do here. Um, I wanna just, you know, talk a little bit about affordable home ownership um, and, you know, our ability to make it more available at lower AMIs. I think that we can make that a reality for a lot of our working class families. And so um, first question is, under this umbrella is, what is the lowest cost on city owned land that we're able to create an affordable home ownership opportunity, whether a single unit, detached, or a condo? What is the lowest production cost that we have been able to find? By production, do you mean the total, like the, 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 cost, the to cost to build? The, the cost, cost to, to build. build, and if included in that, right, so we know that the city itself, which is another issue that we can get into, yeah. right, doesn't have the legal authority necessarily to actually, you know, be doing the actual building, right, right, because it's not a city, pur a municipal purpose. We should, we can tackle that one hopefully soon, but um, for even if it's inclusive of the cost of land and the cost of production, like what is that? baseline so that, because you hear, you know, some developers say, oh, well, we can't provide affordable home ownership at this rate. But I think that that's, I often think that's not true. I think we can be creating affordable home ownership at the 50% AMI, right? Um, and so I'm wondering what is, the, what is the lowest production cost that we've seen for mm -hmm. a unit that can be inclusive of land costs? Yeah. So most, of, I may or may not be answering your question, mm -hmm. but, but if I'm not, then we can certainly follow mm -hmm. up and sit down and, and do a session. But um, most, when we put out an RFP for our land, we, if it's affordable housing and we're subsidizing them, the land costs are $100 per parcel, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, not, it's nominal. Um, and then um, we're just looking for a very high quality construction and, and development, design and development. So right now, uh, to develop an affordable, nice, but you know, not luxurious two bedroom condominium, we're in the fours, we're, we're in the mid fours. Um, I thought I saw somewhere that said 250,000. That's the sale price. Okay. okay. That would be the sale price. That, okay. Um, and then if we're building a single family and, and a lot of our, 
what, what makes it challenging in Boston, but it's also a, a treat in some ways, is that the neighborhoods are so beautiful and the, the, the properties, uh, the surrounding properties are, you know, sort of large and stately that we want, what we want to build is we want it to fit in. We want it to be somewhat contextual. So um, it's costing us sh just shy of $500,000 to build a single family home these days, given labor and the materials due to labor, sh the, the material shortages that we're seeing, that everyone is seeing throughout the country, actually the world. So it's expensive. So we are subsidizing. And that's 500, so 400 for a condo, two, two yeah, bedroom condo, yeah, yeah. 500 for a yeah. single family. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, probably a little less than because we're always trying to beat up and underwrite and try to find economies, but it's hard. So we're subsidizing, um, and then we, if we turn around and sell for two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, depending on interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're always looking at what can a family that makes as much income purchase? So there is variables. What's your down payment? What's your in, what's the interest rate, which has been creeping up slightly? But with, if you use a one plus mortgage, so we're we're subsidizing these like you know one fifty, one seventy five, sometimes two hundred thousand dollars per unit. So that's why it's always it's always very helpful if we can get the state to contribute and they're funding half of that gap. I'm curious what those numbers look like prior to the pandemic. I can get you those. We have those. In terms of that jump, because my understanding, yeah. so I was, um, I've been functioning under the belief that we can actually be doing the building and all of that at 250 and that there's data that shows that we can build whether a condo, a two bedroom condo yeah. at that 250, you know, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been said that we can do that at 250. So I, but I wonder if that was like a pre, -pan, like a pre pandemic. Yeah. Even that number sounds low to me. Mm -hmm. It's what we sell things for. And, and typically it's, they're more expensive and we put out everything competitively, right? So we're looking at those numbers pretty closely, but, um, I, I'd be glad to look at what our development costs have been on average, like 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We have that data. We can get that for you. Yeah. I think that would be great data. Um, I think, and then this is a, you know, we are obviously in an, an affordability crisis and a supply crisis, and everyone wants everything now, as they should, right? Because we spent so much of the last decade building market and luxury rate and not spent nearly the amount of time or political will necessary to build those affordable units. What will be the slowest part, like, in building? affordable home ownership and affordable rental opportunities? Is it going to be the labor? Is it going to be the construction, you know? Assuming that you know we're doing this review on land, that we have the land where we can partner with whoever to do the building. What is going to be the slowest part in actually realizing getting these units created and built? Um, it's a super good question. I, I I think we need to increase, um, but not overwhelm. Uh, I think we need to have the the we need to. Um, we need to shorten the com community process. And by that, I don't mean short shrift the community's voice in this at all. If people know me, I believe in community uh, really uh, having a voice and shaping development proposals. Um, I live for it. But I think sometimes we have a meeting and then we wait another a month or five weeks or six weeks. You know, So I think we need to shorten that but still have a very robust community process. I think probably one of our, our largest obstacles will be if we really increase volume. I'm not saying we shouldn't, and I'm not saying we, we can't rise to the occasion, is a lot of the developers that do this work, um, uh, it, so if we put out dozens and dozens of RFPs and very large amounts of land, I think we're going to see um, some of our uh, our contractors, especially our smaller contracts, our, our contractors of color, start reaching capacity. That I think is going to be one of our, our our obstacles here. And what I what I I don't mind good partnerships if they're meaningful. What I wouldn't want to see happen is um, we just then start uh, these opportunities start going to um, much larger majority. Or, you know what I mean? I, I want to make sure that these uh, remain opportunities for local community developers, too. So there's a lot of challenges, but I think with, you know, development timelines can be shortened just with good management and watching every single day and making it meaningful. Thank you. Madam Chair, do I get an additional question? Or? Uh, we can wrap up after this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd be interested in seeing those prices maybe sure. in bulk, um, the prices. There's a reduction. Yep. So if you're building 200 units much different than building just one. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. All right, uh, Council Lara, your turn. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have one question um, 
about what could be maybe capital investments, and then my last four questions are for fair housing and equity. Um, so I'm a big believer in diversifying housing models. I think that that's the way that, that we're gonna get by, particularly a more democratically run um, housing models like cooperatives and community land trust. I, and this is maybe piggybacking off Councillor Mejia's and Councillor Braden's um, question because I do think that um, this could really be an effective intervention for providing housing for young people and students, um, uh, one housing cooperatives specifically, uh, because they typically take family housing and turn it into rooming homes. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there is any opportunity in our current budget to invest in a study to explore how we can diversify housing models in the city of Boston. We, we, can, we can find money for that. <laughs> There's, I mean, you know, so within our budget or what we have, um, we, we can find money for that. I too, you know, I would like very much to see more cooperatives happen in the city. Um, we just can't seem to get, so we have money available, we have land available, and, and but we have to have willing participants, yes. right? We have to have developers or not, for profit or nonprofit to come forward and say, we like that idea, we want to work with you on that. And folks have been very hesitant about doing more cooperatives in Boston. And I, I think it's a missed opportunity. We see one now and again, mm -hmm. um, we but we don't three, see enough. We have three in my district. And so yeah. I think that there is opportunity to do education, communication, in terms of like housing, so I would love to, to work together. Yeah, to but if there's um, if there's things you want us to study as far as you know, models that we're not seeing enough of here, we can do that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, any questions are for fair housing and equity, and maybe maybe they're not. Thank you so much. Um, so, do you have a position in your cabinet that is focused on oversight of the management companies that manage our public housing developments? Public housing? Yeah, I think that there's. I think specifically like places like Trinity Management or those places. Okay. Yeah, so um, we have a compliance unit that um, every year collects rent rolls mm -hmm. and we study them. We make sure that the, the, the right people, not the right people, but that the, el the eligible households are in those units. Mm -hmm. So we look at um, you know, vacancy rates, we look at uh, incomes, we look at rents being charged, et cetera. So we do that every single year for any project that we have funded. What about things like the rules of the building? Like for example, I have gotten reports from multiple you know, public housing developments where the management company will have rules like you can't stand outside your building or you're not allowed to ride bikes inside of the housing development. And so, mm -hmm. you know, in addition to providing housing for people, we want to make sure that people are living dignified lives um, if they're living in public housing. And so I'm really curious. Uh, one of the things that our office and the committee is going to be focused on is ultimately creating a renter's bill of rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're seeing that. And, and my, my, my other question is around is there a position in the cabinet focused on compliance when it comes to IDP units? And I think that it's in the same vein, right? Mm -hmm. Like you see people moving into these luxury developments in the IDP units and they're not being treated well. And they're, you know, the utilities inside of the, you know, the washing machines, all of it is subpar based, to, based mm -hmm. on the market rate and all of those. And so I'm wondering how are we making sure that people who are living in IDP units, people who are living in public housing, are not only saying, hey, here's an affordable roof over your head, but they're right. also being respected and living right. dignified lives in those places. So in the IDP units, um, in a, the BPDA is before they start, before a development starts, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be looking at issue, the issue of comparability on the affordable units and do, fi and do inspections after the property is built. Mm -hmm. So that does sit with the BPDA. Okay. As we do get complaints, not complaints, we get calls from residents, tenants, saying management is doing this, management is doing that. Um, if it feels like that is, that is potentially illegal mm -hmm. or just bad practice, we will have the Office of Housing Stability follow up. Mm -hmm. Or if I know the management company, I'll just shoot an email to the, the owner saying, you need to investigate this and get back to me. Mm -hmm. But all that to say, counselor, is it's very complaint driven. Mm -hmm. There's not a, like, we're reviewing people's rules and regulations on a yearly basis, but we do follow up on every complaint. But there are funded positions and you do have the appropriate funding to manage the complaints that you're receiving. 
Thank you, sir. I, I would say that um, <clears throat> I, I'm very familiar with what you're talking about, Counselor, and it is one of the things that the Office of Fair Housing and Equity is looking at making sure that, um, especially as we implement the AFFH, mm -hmm. that that is one of the specific things that we deal with, right? Because we do, te technically what happens is you have someone who is in an IDP unit mm -hmm. or an affordable unit, whatever, what, what have you, and they're not afforded sometimes the same amenities or rights, things like that, as mm -hmm. all the other uh, market tenants. Mm -hmm. And that's a no-no, that's not good. So there, there, there is things that we're currently working on that is going to give us the ability, um, God willing, to definitely deal with that and um, rectify those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. That's an incredibly helpful light. I mean, and I said this before that because I live in an IDP unit in my building and so I've had reports from, because I live in my district, I've had my office receive calls from people who live in my building Absolutely. because they know that I, my address is on the ballot and so they know that I live there. And so they will call the people who live in the IDP units in my building will reach out to my office. Complaints about refrigerators not being the same as the refrigerators in the market rate units. People live in a house with their family, the refrigerator significantly smaller, has had to ask to have the refrigerator. I've had to have my washing machine replaced because they gave us a cheap one that broke and right. they've had to up, right like those are the kind of things the lounge in the apartment is meant to be one of the amenities that's included with your rent but they require that you write a 250 fifty dollar check to reserve it right? right those are the kind of things that we're seeing and that's only in like my scope of vision so i'm yeah. wanting mm -hmm. to make sure that one those complaints are coming to your office and that you have this is a budget conversation that you have the resources to respond to them yeah. If I could just add one thing, I, I think, you know, we are, and, and you're, you're well aware because you're involved in this work as well, we are looking at the IDP policy mm -hmm. ac across many, many factors right now. And I think as those issues have been identified, maybe we need to examine the uh, definition of comparability, et cetera. So yes. maybe this is an opportunity to look at that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Great, thanks so much. And uh, ADMI, as the team knows, as a plus one for cooperatives, we have so many, like really actually quite large to scale um, housing cooperatives in District 8, and um, we, we need more of them. They work, they stabilize people. Um, and you know, I think it was a good first step for us to get the co-op training into the curriculum. Um, but I think that this question of kind of like, how do we provide technical assistance and also just kind of that muscle that says this is something we really want to see. I think that's kind of the next frontier on that. Um, on the uh, fair housing testing, I was wondering if you guys could walk us through, obviously this is something where the council supported some substantial new investments over the last few years, but I feel like I don't really understand exactly where we are in terms of like where we've kind of landed with contracting to Suffolk versus in-house and whether I know when we had first funded it, we were discussing kind of making sure the testing was gonna rotate through some like different categories, right? Like thinking about, cause we know for instance, there's a lot of LGBTQ housing discrimination along with racial and along with family. And so I, I think it would just be good for the council to understand kind of where that's landed in the budget because it's been like a series of kind of like one-off investments that we've supported through supplementals the last couple of years. And um, yeah, like what the model's gonna be going forward. Thank you, and um, I'm actually glad to share on that. So testing has been a really, really big hit in our office. Um, so one of the things that's happened is in our first round, you know, in back in July of 2021, you know, there was a Globe article that um, talked about race and voucher discrimination and race discrimination in the city of Boston. And so that's what actually um, led us to working with Suffolk and bringing them on to be the uh, third party tester for us. So um, tough, we, ha we have the data on that and we certainly have, we, out in our first round, we focused a lot on voucher and race discrimination, which we can easily pro provide numbers for that. But what I guess I can tell you that has happened to date is we have done over 100 tests and of those 100 tests that we have conducted in the last year, well, we're still in fiscal year because HUD goes till you know September, but let's just say in the last calendar year, um, we have we have been able to get over sixty six thousand dollars in um, testing settlements um, from evidence that has come in from testing for discriminatory practices, whether with landlords or with um, property owners or real estate 
uh, brokers or firms or what have you. So um, the testing has definitely been extremely successful. One of the things we've also, <coughs> excuse me, been able to do, <coughs> sorry, it's been a long one, um, is to make sure that we can, if anyone has any um, issues or where we hear that there's particular discrimination happening, let's, for example, let's say the seaport, we've been able to direct testing to that neighborhood or to that site um, for, whatever the re for whatever the protected class is that's being um, discriminated against. So we have the ability to create um, specific tests in any specific neighborhood for specific um, uh, our protected classes. You know, the first two that we did certainly was um, voucher holders and race discrimination. And in this round of testing, we're, we will be doing a lot more with disabilities, um, public accommodations, things of that nature. You know, source of income, veterans if the counselor would like, you know. Um, so we, we, we have a phenomenal ability to test just about any protected class and to test in any neighborhood across the city of Boston. Great. So yeah, let me just underscore a couple things. One is I, I do think I know that the, it was limited data, but I think the um, evidence came back that we were seeing huge housing discrimination against trans folks. And I think I know there was a concern that because it was a small population, it might get missed in this and sort of what we were choosing to focus on. But that it seems uh, like, uh, you know, substantiating that and kind of putting people on notice that it's unacceptable to discriminate against um, LGBTQ folks and especially our, our trans Bostonians is important. Um, I also think that I'm interested, Will, in how we can get to the next phase of really like screaming to the rooftops that, you know, that we're catching people and that people are paying fines and that you really got to shape up. Because I think, you know, one of the things we talked about with testing is that that's really that's really where it's sort of amplified impact happens is when we have you know realtors and others who are just like oh damn the city's paying attention to this and that's really what happened in seattle with their program was that folks got concerned and and sort of shaped up practices so um as, as much as i love to get new information in a hearing i sort of like i want that to be something that we're all reading in the paper and, and hearing about so just trying to think through how how we so, can spread the word on that a bit more. Absolutely. So, so one of the things, that one of the agreements that happened um, with that is that we are to draft a report, which we're in the process of doing once we complete the entire fiscal year, which ends in September, that we will submit to everyone. You know, one of the agreements was to the city council, which we've always been like, sure, we will do that, the mayor, everyone across the board. So this will be the official report of what testing is like in Boston, right? And will show the results. Who we, you know, we will list all the bad actors, all the settlements, who it is, what neighborhood, everything from A to Z. It will be in full detail. So once we've um, completed that, I would say by this fall, that report will be out and generated and will be um, given to you. That's not a problem. Okay. All right. I'm looking forward to that and uh, more follow up on that and thinking about how we can expand those resources. I know my timer is going to go off, so I just wanted to put a couple more things on the record for follow up. So one is just Grow Boston. I'm excited about it, but I don't really understand how it's substantively different from the sort of portfolio of urban farms and community gardens that we've supported to date. So I just would love to understand like both the operating commitment and any other like w what is this. Um, because it's a huge, hugely important, I think, but I just don't understand how it's shifting. Um, and then uh, the, damn it, um, <laughs> entered, the, entered that, and uh, I think um, just in general on voucher holders, you know, thinking about how we use the data we're getting on discrimination against voucher holders to think about how to give our developers, rent, landlords, et cetera, in the city guidance on how to not discriminate against voucher holders directly and indirectly. Um, I think we, BHA has done a lot of assessment of what keeps people from being able to rent with vouchers, and I feel like we need to go the next step in kind of telling people this is what affirmatively furthering fair housing looks like in terms of source of income, and I feel like we need to probably draw those threads together a little bit for the industry to be effective. Uh I would say that one of the things that have been very effective towards that is we've worked, we've done over a hundred, a thousand um, educational outreach sessions with, excuse me, we've had over, we've, excuse me, we've had over a thousand participants 
You know, we've been very successful with working with the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, training all their members, um, working directly with Maha. Maha does the um, new home buyers course. We are a um, consistent partner with them where we, any class they're doing that they need, we also do that training as well too, to provide new homeowners and landlords with um, fair housing training. So to date, I know we've had over a thousand participants um, to teach, just to allow people to understand what fair housing laws are, what the do's and the don'ts, um, what discrimination looks like, um, what discrimination looks like, especially with the voucher holders. One of the things we do is we also um, surf the web ourselves, right? We'll scrub Facebook, we'll scrub, um, uh, what's this other one, uh, Craigslist, and anytime we find any um, ads that have discriminatory statements, like they don't rent to folks with Section 8 or things where, um, 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 excuse me, like departments are not deleted, right? We automatically take that. That becomes what is called a commission-initiated um, complaint, where I, for the city of Boston, become the complainant, and we open up an investigation and go right from there. Um, and of course, um, sanctions are given out. They started $10,000 so on, and then for repeat offenders, it gets higher and higher and higher. We also assess compensatory damages and um, um, other damages as well. I'm just trying to blank on the other one we call it, but you know, but this is how it happens. Great, great. Maybe just a word on Grow Boston just before. Okay. Sure. It's, so, it's, um, it's oh, did it go? Oh, it's I didn't hear up. it. I'm sorry. No, no. no I, I wanted to give you more time. Um, <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Can you can you wrap up your last question? Oh, well, I was just going to say, if they had a word on the Grow Boston, what's different thing, I want to ask We, we are doing a lunch and learn tomorrow internally that we will invite you to. Um, uh, which, during you know, council meeting, presumably. Oh, sorry about that. But um, So we'll, we'll get over some better, you know, some detailed information. But the office, you know, we, we in the, the grassroots program, we did a lot of community gardens, and we did some really important farms. Um, Shawnee uh, Fletcher now has been made the director. Her work is unbelievable, second to none. She's hiring a staff person, a project manager. We're going to take on more projects, more community gardens, rooftop rooftop gardens. She's really working closely with the food access, food access and equity office, just making sure that that we're working with a lot of neighborhoods and individual uh, individuals about raised beds. She's looking at innovation, like what can we do to really increase food production in the city? So there's like, we've gone from two things to like five, or, like five or six really important activities, more resource and more staff. But I'll get you, you know, we can get you a, a better, you know, description, but it's, it's gotta really take the work to a, to a much more complicated, many more tasks and a lot more resource. Fantastic, thank you so much. And Madam Chair, if I can put on the record just an info request to the department as well. Um, I want to make sure that we understand what the expiring use properties that are on our radar are, because as we're spending this one-time money, and this will come up in ARPA too, but when we talk about AOP, uh, like I obviously have Amy Lowell apartments in the West End that I'm super concerned about making sure get extended for... Check. Yeah, okay. But, <laughs> no. but you know, just I think we want to make sure that we're not using the one-time funds and not solving some of the expiring use. Absolutely. We can get you a list of whatever time period you like. Um, the next two year, one year, two years, three years, four years, about how many properties we think are at risk. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Council Flaherty, you have the floor. No, good, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sure you remember when I was Chair of Government Ops, we worked closely with D&D uh, &D and the Walsh Administration on the um, local option that adjusted the uh, local room occupancy to 6.5 on the tax that allowed community impact fee of 3% on the short-term rentals. Uh, I know sort of COVID has kind of gotten in the way mm. um, since then. We had estimated, I think that was gonna generate around 5 million for um, efforts around youth homelessness and permanently supportive housing. Did, did we generate the 5 million? Was it off because of COVID and do you expect it to get back on track? Yeah, Councillor. Um, so the good thing for, for us is that even though that was the, the, the that change in the tax was the impetus for us receiving additional funding for the permanent housing. There isn't actually a direct link there as far as the budget goes. So we've been getting that funding every year um, for creating permanent supportive housing. I'm actually not, I don't know, my, my guess is that the tax revenue did suffer during the, during the pandemic, right. it must have. Um, but luckily, you know, the, the city has maintained its commitment, the mayor, the mayor and, the, you know, the, and the city council has maintained that commitment to providing the funding to, 
to, for the affordable housing, and we are putting it to use. Um, that was a big source for the 3368 Washington Street um, project. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the funding came from that. Very good. I assume that maybe we'll bounce back now post COVID with things starting to get back to, yeah. to normal. I'm obviously extremely excited as someone who's born in, in public housing that uh, the capital um, includes 72 million uh, for investments in the BHA, which is great. Uh, shameful argument that the federal government has essentially walked away uh, from their responsibility uh, to help stabilize so many individuals, uh, my family included. So uh, let me know what we can uh, do to be helpful here at this level. I think we're blessed to have Congressman Stephen Lynch, who also was born in public housing, scratching and clawing down in D.C. to get whatever he can get out of the feds for um, public housing, particularly in his district, but also for the city. On the real estate management and disposition front, um, do we have any idea how many city parcels will be suitable for home ownership and suitable for housing that uh, will be sort of uh, released? So, um, right, we have 200 right now that are in process. Uh, we are doing that analysis right now. Uh, we do have a, a pipeline. Most of that, most of the our pipeline is on city-owned land. Um, we have over 500 home ownership units that um, that we that we know of. We're working with the community, or an RFP has already gone out. So we know there's 500. We have a remaining 300 parcels that we're evaluating right now to see whether they would be suitable for open space, home ownership, or, or something other. Sometimes it's senior housing if it's large enough. Um, and I mentioned earlier, I, th I think you probably, I'll say it again though, that we are now working with the BPDA much more closely to come mm -hmm. up with a joint list. What do we have collect? You know, before it was like, we'll do an RFP, right. they'll do an RFP. Now we're really looking at where we have opportunities together and, and making sure that we, we put, get that land into good use. Okay. And I know we've talked about it earlier, the acquisition opportunity program, um, given that we're seeing interest rates tick up, uh, arguably in sort of uh, midst maybe of early stages of recession. Banks get skittish around then. Uh, obviously, sad to hear Sovereign dumping their mortgage program, uh, maybe a factor, maybe not. Capital opportunities slow down. Uh, what thought, I guess, does D&D give to all of that as it pertains to uh, if you have capital, is now the time to sort of pounce on opportunities whereby other folks, investors in particular, um, are now sort of on the sidelines and banks are now getting a little bit more reticent as to who um, they want to back up and, and, uh, and, and, and commit to. Is this the time now where acquis the acquisition opportunity program can sort of now pump, pump in? Even, even if we overpay for parcels or overpay for opportunities, does it make sense to now sort of seize this opportunity? I know it's, uh, you know, it's uh, when things are kind of bad, sometimes these are the things that happen, but when you think about the work that you do and the people that we're trying to help this may be the opportunity for acquisition opportunity program to jump into action more so because the competition may be a little less than under normal sort of economic circumstances so can you share sort of your thoughts with recession and also as it pertains to when you're looking at specific you know bpda projects same thing yeah. uh, with the price of fuel and the price of construction materials everything's going through the roof because of what's happening in the country and beyond uh, adding to those costs and obviously a lens must be given to uh, those factors as well. So how do you sort of size up where we are economically in terms of whether or not you have the ability to now kind of do more than maybe you would be able to do in a in a good economy? It's it's a fabulous point, and I, you know, having been in this in this field for a while, I look back on some of the missed opportunities, and I kick myself not just for my myself, but um, but more for the creation of affordable housing. I am waiting and waiting and waiting for the market to cool, right? So, like, what is it? So, and if it if it cools, and I think we've been pretty, opt, you know, um, opportunistic in the past that when the market starts getting soft, we we do we do increase our efforts to help people purchase and take out of the speculative market. It has been hot for so long that I was thinking the other day, if interest rates go up and prices go down, that we should take this, you know. The federal money, more city money, all, everything we have, and and continue to purchase. Um, what makes me maybe um, a less optimistic than I should be is that while interest rates are going up and it should impact price, because there are so many cash buyers out there that they're no longer as impacted by interest rates as they once were. Um, as you know, our, our home buyers can't compete because with the cash buyers, nor can our nonprofits and some of our for profits that are in the affordable housing world. It's having it's hard for them to compete too. So um, I 
I, your point is very well taken that if the market gets soft, we have to see it as an opportunity. Sometimes, you know, we'll fund a project and we will cringe at the time, right? We'll just cringe, say, oh, this is so expensive, but it's key. It's located in an area, it's full of whatever. And then you look back five years later and you're saying, that's the best deal we've ever done. Boy, we, sh we should have done more. So um, I think in Boston, it's almost always a good time to buy. But certainly, if the values start going down, we should we should collectively do everything we can to purchase. One other last thing you mentioned, and we've done two of them recently, is projects that were that went through the BPDA, that got all of their approvals, and then for whatever reason, the developer didn't want to go forward. We've had nonprofits step in. One in West Roxbury, which is great to see affordable housing in West Roxbury. Another one in JP, a home ownership project. Actually, three. And there's another one in Fenway, where a nonprofit. In every case, it's been a nonprofit has bought the, the permitted project, and we've, we've subsidized and it's now being converted to affordable housing. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, and everyone here for, again, your time and talents. I appreciate that. And just a footnote on the video, I think it was on the slideshow, where you show District 2. I'm surprised Flynn didn't pick up on this, but it says Central, then Dash, South Boston. I would suggest that maybe we add Chinatown on the south end into that. I don't think China, Chinatown's a great neighborhood, as is the south end. I don't think they consider themselves to be central. And with respect to District 1, I don't see North End. Those are really the only three neighborhoods that weren't presented in that uh, slideshow. So if I could offer a suggestion uh, to whoever creates Always. the graph that converts yeah. central to south end and Chinatown, and in District 1, we include the North End, all great neighborhoods. And, the only three that weren't mentioned. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. And again, thank you all for your time and talents and your passion for helping people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Chief, I don't, I don't know who can answer this for me, but what additional positions are being um, created with the 1.2? Sure. Rick, do you want to summarize? So the, the recommended budget includes um, a number of positions. Uh, there are three positions in our in the supportive housing division. Some of these are, um, some of them are brand new positions. Some of them are positions that are currently funded by our one-time COVID funding that we are requested and got a, and got in, you know included in the recommended budget to retain once the grant funding expires. And we were very happy to see that because we know that the need is going to continue, you know, long after um, our funding runs out and long after COVID is hopefully behind us. Um, so three positions in our supportive housing division, uh, and one of those is specifically to focus on street, street outreach and connecting um, homeless individuals with, with housing. Two positions in the Office of Housing Stability. Um, and now, again, both of those are positions that are currently on board, and this will help us, allow us to continue those, those individuals, which we're very excited about. Uh, two positions in the Neighborhood Housing Development um, Division to you know, oversee and help manage, and, and one of them is an architect position to ensure that, to Sheila's point, that we're um, building housing that fits in with the context of the neighborhood and are meeting, you know, good design standards. Um, and then a few positions that are more kind of back office positions, I'll say, um, to look at some of our uh, compliance um, with uh, uh, inclusionary development policy, linkage policy, other compliance needs that we have, and one to um, address some of our, uh, all of the systems and platforms that we have to ensure that residents can interact with us uh, virtually. Um, I think, I forget which counselor it was that talked about kind of the portal for accessing our home, home ownership programs, Th those kinds of, those kinds of, um, Council World, yeah, those are, th to do those kinds of things for us. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the efforts around, you know, substance abuse and just a continuum of system of care and um, service and housing the unhoused um, in that population. Are you able to provide a copy of the um, community of origin data? Uh, for, for our homeless population? Yes. Yes, we will give you what we have. I would say it's self-reported. Um, it's always less than perfect, but it is something that the shelters and people doing street outreach collect but once again, it's self-report, and um, I, I think it. But I think it has utility, so we'll get that to you. Thank you. Sure. Um, and are you able? Are you? Are there any efforts around collaborating um, MOH with public safety, with um, behavior health or mental health providers? So creating sort of. Some sort of, um, I guess I always reference Lisbon, Portugal, for their efforts in mm. curving addiction. Mm. Um, 
is MOH looking at any efforts in, in some sort of like um, action plan or interventive or preventative, um, I, I guess it would be interventive, program that gives people an alternative to probation or harm reduction type of efforts? So we will be updating our, our homeless plan. We had one um, up until 2018. We are about to, um, we are about to go public with, and, and they're really, they're very good. We stand by them. We work really hard against them. We were about to announce it in 2019, the change in administration, COVID. So we have a plan now that was revised and we feel is outdated. And I think uh, to, because some of the things that have happened that, you, that you're raising, mass cast happened, right? Um, COVID happened and uh, our homeless populations have changed. The needs are different. So um, I think this year we will be updating and I would love to see us be, have stronger collaboration with um, our criminal justice system, our mental health system, uh, which we work very closely with, but I think those could be even strengthened after what we've been through. So the answer is yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm prattling on, but the answer is yes. We will be, we will be releasing a, a new plan this year. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I guess, are there any type of educational or technical um, type of training for communities? So for example, I know that most of the community comes in and everyone is already affected, so they are charged with you know, passion. And, but I think sometimes a lot of people are not used to the terminologies or the processes or the protocols or policies. So they're not really able to properly advocate as they should or they could. And I wonder, aside from community processes and RFPs, are we engaging community in a way where we can empower them by educating them on the processes? You, and just clarification, you mean the development process? Yes. Yes. Development. Um, understanding what policies are in place. For example, like we know that developers can't actually say that the AMI has to be 70%. BPDA can't say that either. It's not a thing. But community may not know that. So they'll come in and they'll say, okay, fine, I guess 80% AMI, and then they'll let it go. But then they'll cry about it, right? Like we all cry about it afterwards. And so I wonder, you know, if we can create those opportunities, listening sessions, collaborations with counselors to do listening sessions in their district or at large um, to educate the public, what are the actual policies in place, right? And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I meet with, we have an advisory council in District 7. So all the civic leaders meet with me every single Saturday. I love them to death. Hopefully we'll get to like once a month where we're like really organized. Um, but all the aunties and uncles, like they're like 45 of them, right? So we're really gets trying to streamline a process that we can deliver to BPDA. And how, then how can we, if it, one doesn't exist, how can we collaborate with you in creating that educational series of, so that people can... Fabulous, fabulous idea. And I, and I something's... Uh, I'm, I'm remembering that, but I could be wrong, maybe I dreamt it, um, but the BPDA used to do um, like learning sessions or workshops on the development process. It's ridiculously complicated, right? I mean, I, and, and like, but, but I don't know if they did it was in such a way that it, I think it was like, this is Article 80 and this is what, but, but I, think, I think what I'm hearing you say is, how do we let community members know what we what what they can influence right so it's probably both it's like this is development process and this is what you can influence through conversation um, and I know when we go out with land you know RFPs we do RFPs all the time we do start we, we do start by saying what kind of input we're looking for affordable to whom you know uh, what should this development, what should the site be? Should it be open space? Should it be development? So I think we, we do pose questions before a process most of the time. Um, but I think it's both. I think it's like this is how development happens and this is what we want to hear from you about. And so I think we have a new, we have a new opportunity with the BPDA. You know, um, I soon to be Director Jemison, I've known him for many years. 
he, this is this is in his his DNA. Um, so I'm really excited that I think it's going to be a whole new day, and I think he he would really welcome these conversations. I, I really do. I'm I'm very excited about him coming. So, okay, so I think he would welcome Chief that. Dylan said no. I no. It's and he and he would not, and he would agree. I mean, he, that's part of it's what he's been doing his whole life. So I think he would love to think through with this body and with us about how to make the development process more accessible to to neighborhoods and communities, and not so not so frightening. I, you know, I've been joining, in my own neighborhood lately, I've been joining community meetings as a citizen, and I'm saying, I don't like that design. And, and I'll, I'll hear my, you know, my neighbors say, oh, I didn't know I could influence that, you know, things like that. So I, I think people need to be, not told, but I think they need to be given the license to influence what they see fit. Mm. The other point. Uh, part of this is, so like, if we, you and I were going into some partnership, and I want it, and, and you know, and we, we're we're deciding on speculate, you know, specs, and we're saying, you know, I want this or I want that. Before that, it makes sense that we meet first for a casual meeting to talk about the overview, mm -hmm. right? And so, by the time the community gets to the process of engagement, there there's been no the overview felt rushed. Could we do that without developers first, and with O and S, for example, and sort of iron out and make, everyone's feeling okay. Mm -hmm. Like now we're gonna move into where it's question and answers. And I think, you know, there's, there's this hostility, right? Back and forth with developers and developers are saying the cost and they're saying something else. And then the other part is like community benefits that, you know, how is that negotiated? And what is sort of one pipeline, like one streamlined process? What is that? And so, so, many, so much to do. I mean, I, I can't wait to meet, um, the, the new chief and do some work with that. Um, I yield uh, the rest of the questions and counselors, please, if you have uh, final questions or remarks, um, Councillor Lujen, you first and then. <coughs> okay. okay. Councillor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had two questions that I didn't think I was going to get to ask and I sent to the director through IGR, um, but I will speak them out loud for the record. Um, one of them is a question about if, if we were to financially invest in supporting the creation of tenants unions inside of our public housing developments, would that live in your department? And then the second question is what involvement does the Office of Fair Housing or the Mayor's Office of Housing have with ISD and the proactive rental in inspection program or any of the complaints that come, like the housing complaints that come through ISD? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As the former commissioner of housing at ISD, I, I know that one well. <laughs> well, great, because I'm going to invite you to a hearing. <laughs> but for the first one, tenants unions, I, I, the, the simple straight answer is I don't know. Okay. I, I don't mm -hmm. think so. I, I'm not, I would have to research that. Uh, but I, we don't deal with tenant unions, mm -hmm. you know, because we're very complaint driven and such. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that we would have um, any stake in it from a uh, activist standpoint, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, as for ISD, we deal very directly with ISD. You know, they enforce the state sanitary code, but there are instances where we have cases where we need to pull ISD's records from the housing division mm -hmm. um, regarding um, a housing provider to figure out some of the things that they may or may not have done that actually add as evidence mm -hmm. to or nice. support a claim of um, housing discrimination or refute it, you know. So we work very, very closely with them. Um, the only, and it's interesting, we refer a lot of um, constituents to them as well too because what happens is oftentimes when people hear fair housing, they're like, oh, well, my lamp isn't working or my, you know, smoke tech isn't working or my gas stove, oh, wow, that's not fair. Let me call these guys. Mm -hmm. And we have explained to them that, you know, um, fair housing has to deal directly a lot with housing discrimination and refer them to ISD for that reason or some even at times to the Office of Housing Stability as well too. So um, the answer to your question is we do work with them to re re retain information for uh, evidentiary purposes and to also refer constituents that have issues that are housing issues that are not discrimination based to them. Okay. Um, um, no further questions, Madam Chair. We have a one on meeting. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I guess I always um, want to know if you have any final comments or, 
for us before we close? Um, I'll just say that it was a, it, I want to thank you for a really good hearing. Um, I learned some things. We got some new ideas that we can follow up on, but it was very respectful. And I know you care about this issue as much as we all do. So I look forward to uh, working on follow-up questions. We'll get them over to you as quickly as possible. And look, I don't, there's no one division or one department or one elected official is going to solve this issue. We're only going to solve it uh, collectively. So look forward to working with you all. Thank you. I, I would just echo uh, Chief Dillon's comment and say thank you. I think this was a really good hearing. You certainly asked questions that I had not thought about or um, even were very interesting that just crossed my mind. I was like, wow, that's, that's really interesting. It's something to think about, look at, you know. Um, so I, I guess I just have to really thank the council and thank all of you for this hearing and thank my colleagues as well, too. Yeah, you know, these new counselors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I thank you for your work, for your time, for your uh, transparency and courage to coming in and being so honest with us. We look forward to uh, sending, submitting any additional questions. I'm sure there won't be too many more. Um, and the counselor, we have actually reserved dates for additional hearings. Um, it is totally a consensus whether or not we call you back, um, but it would be just for an hour sort of session. Um, thank you again, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.